we're going to get going. <clears throat> Mr. Stewart, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Uh, Genevieve, are you ready to go? Okay. We have a quorum of council present here in the chambers. So I'm going to get going. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mike Little, Mayor for the District of North Vancouver. I want to uh, welcome everybody here to uh, your community's house. We are all guests in it here to serve our community. Uh, tonight, uh, Monday, October 4th at 7 o'clock, we have a regular meeting of council. This meeting is going to be uh, hybrid. And again, what that means is that some members of council, some members of staff, some members of the public are going to be in person and some are going to be uh, joining the meeting online. So it's a little bit of a change in technology for us. We're still working some of the bugs out. The one piece of advice that I would give to uh, uh, community members here is uh, keep your volume off on any devices that you may have. Otherwise it may loop back uh, through the system. And uh, hopefully we won't have one of those loud shrieking noises take place in this meeting. Uh, at this point, uh, Council, an agenda has been uh, presented and circulated. Are there any errors or omissions from the uh, agenda as presented? Hearing none, will someone move adoption of the agenda? I'll move. Moved by Councillor Forbes, second by Councillor Kern. Call the question. All those in favor? Contrary minded. Motion carries. Okay, and the next item up, we have no minutes uh, to be received at this point. And so we're going to go straight into the, uh, uh, the public portion of the meeting. So at the front end of every council meeting, we reserve up to uh, 30 minutes to uh, hear from our community and uh, people who have signed up in advance or people who are present in the chamber here or we'll do our best to add people online. If you've uh, signed up, uh, you'll have an opportunity to address council for up to three minutes time. Uh, and I have a list of speakers that have signed up in advance. Uh, the first speaker is Paul Dean. Paul Dean, can you hear me? I see. Paul yes, Dean. I can hear you fine. Yes, I can hear you now. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, welcome. You have three minutes to address the council. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Paul Dean, Leader of Business Development for Core Education and Fine Arts Early Learning Schools, affectionately called CIFA School, out of thousands of local families who attend them each year for the past 23 years. I'm here this evening to speak to you on behalf of our founder and CEO, Natasha Baim, in support of item 8.8 .8 on tonight's agenda. Fairborn Properties' exciting proposal for the corner of Crown Street and Mountain Highway. Today we have 31 early learning schools. The first school opened its doors here on the North Shore in 1998. Its goal was simple, to offer an all-day school that focused specifically on the education of children ages 1 to 5. The CIFA curriculum and methodology is based on research of best practices internationally, as well as a deep understanding of children's brain development in the first five years. Every one of our schools teaches children the most essential skills like reading, writing, STEM, music, art, mindfulness, yoga, and many other subjects. The very best part of it is that all the education never infringes on their time to play because everything we teach is presented through games, exploration, and fun activities. We deliver our carefully researched curriculum and deliver it in such a unique and impactful way. Our early childhood educators are, in addition to their college and qualifications, specifically trained through the CIFA teacher training. Within the province, CIFA employs approximately 600 full-time educators, and within their communities, our schools each create over 20 full-time employment positions for passionate early childhood educators. As you are aware, Fairborn's proposal includes the provision of a new childcare and learning space for the Lynn Creek community. Should the proposal be approved by council, CIFA Early Learning intend to operate this space and deliver world-class early childhood learning opportunities for even more North Shore children. CIFA currently has both of which are already in very high demand and at or nearing capacity with a notable shortage in the infant toddler age groups. With this in mind, we have no doubt that the creation of 120 new childcare and learning spaces should be of huge benefit to the district. As an extension to this, and with the evolution of the CIFA model, 
our ability to offer flexible programs designed for the ever-changing needs of parents and their children in the district presents a value with far-reaching benefits. On behalf of our team of educators and our North Vancouver families, we extend our wholehearted support for Fairborn's proposal for the town centre area of Lynn Creek, and we look forward to hearing your discussion about the future of this neighbourhood. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Paul Dean. The next speaker I have is Joy Hayden from Hollyburn Society. Joy Hayden, can you hear me? Ms. Hayden, you're you're still muted on my screen. Are you able to? Uh, there we go. There we go. Can you hear yes. me? Beautiful. Yes, I can. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Nice to be speaking to you all once again on an exciting new project coming to the District of North Vancouver. My name is Joy Hayden and I'm the Director of Innovation and Engagement at Hollyburn Family Services Society. I'm here this evening to voice my enthusiastic support of item 8.8 .8 on tonight's agenda, Fairborn Properties proposal for 1510, 1530 Crown Street and 420, 440 and 460 Mountain Highway. As council is aware, but perhaps for some listening who may not know, our organization, Hollyburn, supports youth, seniors, individuals, and families experiencing socioeconomic issues across the North Shore. We've been around since 2004, and since the vast majority of those we support are at housing risk, we do keep an eye on the existing housing marker, in particular housing affordability. I don't need to remind Council of the intense shortage we're facing with regards to safe, secure, affordable housing. The last 18 months has only heightened the need for greater supply and greater affordability across the housing spectrum for our community. And for this reason, we're very pleased to see over 50% of the housing proposed here will be secured as rental with 45 homes designated as below market rates. While market rental is expensive for many, it is our affordable housing stock of the future and we need to keep building it. For Hollyburn, we're focused on assisting with the delivery and management of below market affordable homes for both seniors and youth. So I will keep my comments related to the potential for 45 new homes for people currently living in our community and currently in need. While we are in preliminary discussion only with Fairborn, our hope is that we may have an opportunity to offer some of these homes to those in need across the community. This project is attractive to us because of its location in a mixed income building with strata, market rental and below market rental, as well as immediate access to groceries, parks and transit in the area. In our opinion, this proposal provides the opportunity for a high quality, complete and inclusive community that will offer a meaningful benefit to the broader neighborhood, including those requiring income assistance with housing. I encourage you to vote in support of this application tonight and move it ahead to a public hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Joy Hayden. The next speaker I have is Easton Smith. Easton Smith, can you hear me? Checking, Ms. Clark, have you seen Easton Smith log on yet? Is there an Easton Smith in the gallery here? Okay, we don't appear to have Easton Smith uh, attached to the meeting at this point. And so I'm gonna go through the rest of the list and uh, I'll come back to Easton Smith at the end if, to see if they log on. The next speaker I have is Peter Teven here in the chamber. Mr. Teven, come on up. There we go. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, Peter Tivan, 1900 Block Indian River Crescent. I was a little confused because I show last on the list there, but uh, that's okay. I managed to get my notes written down. <laughs> uh, so thank you. Um, the first thing I'll, I'm gonna try to touch on a couple of issues tonight in my comments. Um, so I'll try to be quick. Uh, the first one is a general comment, maybe could be attributed to the council procedures agenda item, but I just feel that there are too many items that are being handled with first, second, and third reading all in one night. I, I don't think that this allows for meaningful public input, especially when there's so little time to digest the agenda. Uh, and I'd rather see us do it when we're forced to, rather than when we get to. Um, 
So, so I'm concerned about that. My next comment is on uh, agenda item 8.8. Uh, the development proposal for 420 units of housing at Mountain Highway in a mixed use development, Mountain Highway and Crown. Uh, I'll certainly have a lot to offer on this if it gets to public hearing, but I do have a couple of questions and perhaps staff could address them to council after or when council sees fit to ask these questions. But the first one is there's a child care center in the proposal and air quality was a problem for child care at Sealand. So I'd be interested to learn has the health authority in their child care branch approved this site for air quality. Uh, second, in the June 2021 pace of development report, uh, I want to know if this proposal and its 420 units was shown as in stream in that report, or was it not yet in stream? Because I want to remind council that if it was not yet in those numbers in stream, you take 420 off of the remainder, it probably got about nine years to get a thousand more units in order to fulfill our OCP uh, expectations. Uh, it's a long time for just a few projects. So uh, I also want to comment on 8.3, which is uh, it's the repeal of the uh, the um, demolition permit bylaw, but in the materials was the rental uh, tenants uh, relocation assistance program policy. And, and I don't want to miss the opportunity to comment on that because I feel it's very short of what is needed in that policy. To be frank, what we needed in that policy was outside the box thinking. And this is so inside the box, it is literally laid out in boxes. Uh, you know, I, I want to you know, suggest to council that I believe that your job is the following. Protect the people and the interests of the citizens of North Vancouver District. And if we allow eviction of our own citizens outside the district, could you have failed them any more profoundly? So uh, what I've always suggested, this goes back to the last council in 2018, is that that policy include a provision that says an eviction and demo permit will not be allowed if there are less vacancies inside the borders of the district of North Vancouver then there are families getting evicted. That is nowhere near that policy. And I think it's essential. How can a council make a decision that makes me or anyone else no longer a citizen of this municipality? Thank you, Thank you Mr. Tiemann. Uh, am I co-host? Okay, the next speaker that I have is Juan Palacio. Welcome. Thank you, Your Worship and members of the council. I'm Juan Palacio. I'm from 200 on Kings. I'm here to speak about uh, the items discussed in last week's uh, special meeting, the improving civic engagement with youth and young adults. I wanted to say that I fully support young adults committees and youth committees. Uh, however, I believe that there was a debate about the age range. It was proposed to be up to like 39 years old, while it was discussed to maybe limiting it to 25 years old. I believe that this short age range is not a good idea and it's better to have the larger age range. This is because I am currently 26, so selfishly I wanna be in this council uh, or this advisory committee and also because I don't think that people in that young, younger age range are actually gonna be too interested or even have the time to uh, participate in these things. Not only do they have school from like nine to 3 p.m., they also have soccer and any sort of after school plans and then TikTok and Netflix and they gotta fit that all in. And uh, it was also discussed that the district government is welcoming of young adults and youth. I believe that it is very welcoming as in anyone can come in, but not very appealing. I'm usually the only young adult who attends anything. There is uh, also a discussion about how much young voices are heard. And there's, there's discussion about how big social movements, there's always the voice of the young adult being heard, but that's usually environmental movements or LGBTQ things. 
And anything that gets big news, it's usually because it's the young adult that decided to participate. Not really because there's lots of 18 year olds, it's because that one 18 year old came out to speak. If we want these younger groups, like the youngest age range to participate, I think we have to get it started and get it rolling with a wider age range and use that to encourage younger age people to, to join. If you set the restriction, like if you set it to 18 to 25, it is probably not gonna get much appeal. It is probably only gonna be attracting the few students who run for student council and have a little bit of interest in that. And if you use Robert's rules, nobody's gonna be interested in that. I also recommend you offer free pizza. Free pizza, I might be able to get behind that, that's for sure. <laughs> Thank you for your comments, Juan. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker I have is uh, Esther Murrenbeel. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm here as president of the North Shore Pickleball Club to say thank you. On behalf of North Vancouver pickleball players, present and future, thank you for the new courts that will be built in. Thanks also to the time you have taken to listen, read, and meet with us in the last several months. The parks manager called me just 10 days ago to let me know. And as you may remember from the passionate speeches here in July and possibly the many, many letters and emails you received, this has been a very important and significant gift to many people. Pickleball may sometimes seem like a silly game with a silly name, but in reality, it's been about mental health and physical health for many of us, especially in these last 18 months. One of the best things about it is the social connections people make. As one person told me, you can hike or ski, but with pickleball, you need three other people and you need to get them. So you can be busy with your life, but then stop in for an hour or two to socialize with some people and get some exercise. I want to especially thank the tennis playing community east of Seymour for giving up some of their space so that their neighbors and and friends who happen to play pickleball can do so within their own neighborhood. Let me say, we understand your passion. It may be that one day you will want to give pickleball a try and you are always welcome. I would also like to thank Lauren Smith of the Sports Council and David Hibbard from Parks for their very hard work and patience mediating over the last several months. And thank you to the new district parks manager, Stephanie Warnier, for catching quickly and carrying the process forward. I'm excited to say that we're now working with your parks designer and believe we can create six beautiful new courts that should be ready in the spring. Earlier today at Myrtle Fraser, volunteers were introducing pickleball to 26 grade seven students. They are the next generation who will be appreciating this legacy that's being built today. And again, we wanna thank you very much you're all invited to our opening day party and we hope we can introduce you personally to the game of pickleball, just call me. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Uh, the next speaker I have is Renee Gorley. In person, welcome. Am I muted? I don't know, I don't think so. Nope, Enjoy you got a red light on your box. You're good, uh, good to go there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you all again. I haven't been here for, I think, over a year. Uh, so I'm here uh, speaking tonight on behalf of the Delbert Community Association, and I live at, on the 600 block of St. Ives Crescent. Um, tonight, I want to, I want to speak, uh, not related to the agenda, about uh, speeding on Delbert, which is uh, obviously a passion of the Delbert Community Association. As you know, this, the street is built for um, Autobahn style speeds, uh, and we do see them. Um, what is it? Uh, 400 cars on a weekday and over a thousand on weekend days are passing by at uh, more than 15 kilometers over the speed limit, so 65 or more. And we see speeds up to 100 kilometers per hour on our street. Um, last year, uh, we uh, worked very closely with Steve Carney and we were able to get some uh, flashing lights on our. Uh, on our crosswalks, and that has helped a lot. Um, and this year, we thought we were going to get a, a bump out at Evergreen. And uh, again, that would help to constrict traffic and slow it down a little bit. Uh, that's been an off again, on again project. 
At the end of last year, it was on. Beginning of this year, we had a new person in charge at traffic. It was off. And then I think through some um, intervention on your part, it was back on again. And then now we hear that it's it's kind of like a pilot project with maybe a few pylons. And we're obviously uh, quite disappointed in that. What we were expecting is a proper bump out. Uh, we see them across the North Shore and the other municipalities. We'd like to start seeing them here as well and get our traffic under control because there's simply no enforcement. Thank you very much for your time this evening and for all you do for Renee Gorley. Gorley. Uh, I'll make sure that our engineering staff reach out to the community association and follow up on that. Okay, uh, just uh, returning back to earlier in the list, uh, has Easton Smith been able to join the meeting? Okay, so we still don't have Easton Smith uh, attached to the meeting, so uh, we'll move on. I do have a couple of other speakers that are signed up to speak at the items, and so when those items come up, I'll be returning to the uh, public input. Uh, we still have uh, some time, and so I guess I will put out the call there. Uh, would anybody else like to address the council? We could probably take another two speakers. Okay, hearing none, seeing. Okay, hang on here. So if we can promote that attendee. Uh, there's a virtual attendee named Shirley. Uh, if you could. Uh, uh, tell us your name and, and approximately where you live, and then uh, you'll have three minutes to address council. Hi, uh, my name is Shirley. I think I've communicated with all of you there. My name is Shirley Friesen. I live in Edgemont. Um, on August 18th, um, my daughter, myself, and my dog were attacked by a dangerous dog. Um, I became aware that day that the District of North Vancouver bylaws was aware of this dog was aware that it had attacked dogs before, was it aware that it had no license, was aware that it had um, an owner that um, was not um, paying his fines when he was um, fined for all of these infractions, and there was no enforcement whatsoever, and they weren't surprised at all when I called to say that this had happened. Um, since then, nothing still has happened except that the dog was taken away and uh, euthanized, but only because the owner could not pick it up. The district, I was made aware, was going to give that dog back to the owner, even though that dog um, and two other dogs in that property um, had been running free for a, a long time, for at least a few months. I became aware that my neighborhood is not safe on that day. And I have become more keenly aware of how unsafe it is since that day. Um, not only because the property where this tenant lives um, is um, has dangerous dogs, but also because, as I learned from the neighbors who have taken videotape and photographs and sent them to the District of North Vancouver and the RCMP, who have done nothing with them, of pictures of prostitution being um, conducted out of the, that building, of drug dealing happening out of that building, the dogs being in great distress and causing the neighbors all kinds of problems, no enforcement whatsoever, no warning to the public whatsoever. If I had been warned, I would have been able to at least keep my dog away from there, not walk around there, or at least had some kind of bear spray that I could have defended us with. But the District of North Vancouver bylaws did not warn the public. And I have been told that it is not their job to do that. And my daughter asked the mayor as well, why is it that you can warn us about wild animals like bears and cougars, but not of a dog when you know that this dog has attacked before? No good answer. Somebody from the district called me and said, oh, we only post on bears because we want you to put your garbage away. It's not for your own protection. You know what? That, that just flies in the face of everything I've ever known in North Vancouver. And I've lived here for 20 years. I'm offended by this. I'm offended by the lack of response. I have tried to get a hold of the mayor and council to get an emergency meeting because the neighbors are upset. That derelict house that is on that property is in that shape, is with those neighbors. I believe that this is the fault of the DNB for not, not addressing the concerns of the owner of that property soon enough and leaving them in that situation where the neighbors are basically being held hostage and the owner of the property is being held hostage. And, you know, I just heard somebody talking about affordable housing and I get that and I'm totally behind that, but this is not that. This is not that. We need to have both. 
And, you know, the, I have not paid enough attention to municipal politics. And from now on, I swear to you, I will. From now on, I will. And you know what? Because all voices need to be heard and all voices are not being heard. Progress does not just mean affordable housing. Of course, it means affordable housing and making sure that citizens, you know, have options. It does not mean holding back progress because you don't think there needs to be any more um, million dollar townhouses. You know what? There needs to be more million dollar townhouses too, because, you know, let's just look at some math here. Get some business people to, in to do some explaining about supply and demand. The more supply you have, the less demand, and then the prices will actually come down. It's so we're not just addressing the needs of some... Council so anyways, I'm, I'm, I'm painting a bigger picture here of why, like, there is no good reason for no progress to be made in terms of this dangerous site. This place needs to be demolished. These, these, we need new bylaws and we need enforcement agents. And I want an answer as to how this is going to be addressed to keep us safe. How, how are your we going to start enforcing passed. the bylaws? Thank you very much for your comments today. Uh, I don't think it's fair to address it as, and say that, that no action has been taken. There's been more than 14 tickets issued to the site. The dog was uh, detained and was actually euthanized. Uh, and the RCMP have been very active on the site. I, so I, I get that it's not satisfactory and there's more we can do and there's more work we have to do to support the neighbors in that area. But uh, I don't think it's fair to characterize it that, that nothing is taking place there. Are there any other members of the public wishing to address the council meeting? Okay, thank you very much. We're gonna move on to uh, the rest of the meeting. Okay, the next uh, item that I have uh, is a celebratory note. We have our recognitions. So the District of North Vancouver has um, uh, uh, gives out Centennial Bursary Awards every year. So I'm gonna make a brief statement and announce the, uh, the, the winners for this year. I'm very pleased to be announcing the recipients of this year's Centennial Bursary Awards. This scholarship is from a trust fund that was endowed in 1958 to commemorate the centennial of the province of British Columbia. These recent uh, district high school graduates have distinguished themselves both academically and in our community. Congratulations on this significant achievement to Brianna Bisseon, Jack Burnett, Kobe Conrad, Max Cunningham, Nathan Daly, Lauren Fishman, Sarah Galvin, Samantha Johnson, Cameron McCallum, Anita Moazafi, Lucas O'Brien, Yvonne Orr, Klaus Severin, and Megan Fitchner. I wish them all the best on their post-secondary academic journey on behalf of the council. Congratulations. Okay, council, on to uh, item Eight, this is reports from council or staff. And uh, uh, first up, we have item 8.1, and this is the Community Heritage Advisory Committee update. We have a number of volunteers in the community who uh, come out to support the preservation of heritage in our community. And uh, we, we love to check in with them from time to time, hear what they're working on. And today I have uh, Jennifer Clay uh, coming to present, and I hope you can introduce- I will introduce Anne Saville too. And uh, I don't know if and you I can tell who else from your committee is on the meeting. I think you're going to bring them up on the screen. If we can. Uh, I don't know if we can promote any, any committee members that we see. I see Jim Paul. Yeah, Jim should be there. Phil. Can you see them? Okay. So we, we've offered promotion so that they could come in, but I see Jim, ah. Jim Paul in there and... Uh, uh, Okay, uh, we can't see do, them, but that's fine. <laughs> some so. of them don't have full names, so I okay, can't. Okay, uh, no worries. Yeah. We will introduce them by name anyway. Fantastic. So. Well, thank you. So, good evening, Mayor Little and members of Council. My name is Jennifer Clay, and uh, I'm here tonight representing the Heritage Advisory Committee. Sitting beside me is Anne Saville. She is our chair. And other members of the committee who may or may not be on the call um, are Jim Paul, who's our vice chair. Rob Greasdale, Melanie Montgomery, Bob Muckle, Phil Bainton, Alistair Moore, and last but not least, Councillor Bond. 
<laughs> uh, so we're here tonight to give you an update on um, the activities of our committee. And uh, just to ease into the presentation uh, slowly, uh, here's a couple of pictures of heritage homes that are on the register. The first is uh, at 732 East 8th, that's circa 1925 house. And um, so we have a lot of early sort of 20th century homes and as well a lot of mid-century homes. So the second photo is at 931 Canyon Boulevard, um, which is a Lewis Post and Beam house circa 1958. So the purpose of um, our presentation is to provide an update on the activities um, and outcomes since our last workshop with um, you, which I think was in 2016 actually. Um, and to seek your input and support and to continue to foster a productive partnership with you. So just to remind you, um, the focus of uh, the Heritage Advisory Committee is to provide input on heritage matters as they relate to built heritage. And as of um, the passing of our heritage strategic plan, we expanded our scope to include also um, heritage landscapes and cultural, cultural heritage. So a bit of background, because most of you weren't here back in 2016, uh, but there was an HRA application up at 360 East Windsor in Upper Lonsdale. Um, and that involved the subdivision of um, a 100 foot lot into uh, 250 foot lots. And it was very contentious. Um, many neighbors were strongly opposed and in the end, uh, council did not, um, it went before a public hearing and council did not approve um, that HRA. And for our committee, that was um, really um, unfortunate and frustrating. And so we voiced our concern actually in a public, in the public um, uh, speaking or in, what, what do you call it? The one that what the people just did here and um, that resulted in a workshop. Um, with council and that in turn uh, resulted in council's decision to reinvest in heritage. So that was back in 2016. So the outcome um, took a long time, but from 2016 until 2019, um, uh, under Angel Clark, who was uh, the staff liaison at the time, uh, lots and lots of public consultation. And ultimately we ended up with a really comprehensive heritage strategic plan um, that council approved in um, 2019. And I can say that I don't think there's any other municipality um, on the North Shore or even hardly any in Vancouver who have such a comprehensive um, heritage strategic plan. So big feather in our cap. Um, as well, uh, we got a new staff liaison who was Angel Clark. She's the one who basically stick handled the um, uh, lead up to the heritage strategic plan and she's since left and now we have Nicole Foth who is um, doing a great job in that role as well. And then we also got um, a, a dedicated community service clerk to come and take uh, minutes. Um, th this has made a huge difference in terms of our productivity and accountability um, because prior to that the staff liaison was taking notes. So in terms of the initial uh, implementation of the Heritage Strategic Plan, um, the first thing we did was um, offered uh, council tours of heritage homes, one in 2019 and one in 2020. And that was because all of you were relative, most of you were relatively new um, and we thought it would be a good idea for you to see examples of um, successful heritage projects. We also continued to um, award um, properties that had done extensive uh, re restoration work or just some renovation work. Um, so recognize them publicly for their good work. And a significant um, outcome has been the um, update of the Heritage Register and the digitization of the Heritage Register. So it is now online for everyone to see which houses are on, on the Heritage Register and why and provide background on them. Um, as well, we in this year, I guess you just approved uh, funding for a dedicated um, full-time or temporary uh, full-time heritage planner, which will be fantastic. I think there's an ad out to hire that person. And so once that person is hired, will make a big difference. So they're not splitting their time amongst a, a number of portfolios. 
And uh, finally, one of the most fantastic outcomes um, uh, in terms of the initial implementation of the Heritage Strategic Plan is the approval um, this July of the $50,000 grant program that, um, again, there is nothing like this that exists anywhere on the North Shore for sure and very few other municipalities that I know of that have this. So this is fantastic in terms of helping heritage homeowners with upkeep and, and that sort of thing. So. Um, so in terms of the, just a couple of photos here to back up some of those uh, bullets, uh, the Heritage Home Tour in 2019, I think most of you attended, um, but uh, the photo on the left is of 114 West Windsor, and that was a house that um, sat on two legal lots and um, ended up uh, being, um, an HRA was approved that allowed a subdivision of this um, property into four skinny lots. Uh, and the heritage home was moved. Um, the other home that we visited was at 3623 Sunnycrest. Uh, this is an Arthur Erickson home called, uh, previously called the Wedge Home because it's triangular shaped. And they basically enclosed their garage and all the space between the garage and the house and expanded the uh, living um, space for, for and updated it basically. And the past owner of this house was actually on the Heritage Advisory Committee, and she and her husband decided to undertake this renovation to um, allow the house to be modernized, and um, they wanted it to be retained, and so because they were, were planning to sell it. So I can tell you that it just sold for a record $3.4 million a couple of months ago. That was $400,000 over asking, so... Clearly that strategy worked in terms of um, updating the house and um, and making it attractive to a new family who, who have um, now moved in. Uh, the second uh, heritage tour, um, we just visited one house and this actually is the house of one of our um, uh, members of Heritage Advisory Committee, Phil Bainton. Uh, he, this is a Russell, uh, sorry, a Fred Hollingsworth house um, that he has meticulously restoring and still restoring to this day um, using the services of Russell Hollingsworth, who's the son of uh, Fred Hollingsworth, the original architect. And that's, of course, an example of a West Coast modern house. So the next part of the presentation, we're just sort of going to split it into the good news and the bad news. So let's start with good news. Um, so year after year, we, we um, undertake or we make decisions on heritage awards and we also give out heritage grants. So the good news is there's a lot of heritage homeowners who care about their house, who do renovations and um, get awards and grants. So that's the good news. And then um, there's a couple of houses, um, addresses on our good news slides, which I'll just move to. So you've already seen this one. This is the 114 West Windsor. So uh, the picture on the left is before and that really doesn't do justice to just how bad how badly derelict this this house was the condition was in it was falling apart tons of water damage um and so yeah it's been restored and um is now being lived in the second example is at uh, 1160 ridgeway ridgewood drive um this actually also appears on our bad news um slides uh the good news is a heritage uh HRA um, was approved on this property, but that was about 10 years ago. And after that, it basically sat um, and was exposed to the elements and really was not, is not been in great, is not in great condition. And as well, there isn't really very much of the original home being proposed um, to be retained. Um, and now we get to the bad news, which as you can see, has a lot more addresses on it. Um, we'll just go through them one by one. So this is the same house, Ridge 1160 Ridgewood Drive. There's a couple of pictures of the original interior showing some amazing 1960s glasswork and stone fireplaces, a stone fireplace. Um, in May 2021, uh, the HRA that had been approved um, was reactivated. Um, and uh, unfortunately, what happened was the uh, developer seems to have come in and really done uh, some serious damage to the house. And so unfortunately, there's been a stock work order um, put in place because, as you can see, what's really left is sort of the fireplace, which is being propped up by um, some pieces of wood. And so I understand that the stock work order is 
still in effect. So this is why we put it on the bad news, because although an HRA was approved, it was left to deteriorate. And um, unfortunately, there's not much left at this point. So I'm not sure where this one's going to go. Um, 360 Windsor, this is the house that basically started um, the, the, the discussions um, leading to the Heritage Strategic Plan. As you can see on the left, it's a really beautiful cottage with a hip roof. And um, after the HRA failed, um, the owners undertook extensive uh, renovation and um, unsympathetic um, at least from a heritage standpoint. And so our committee uh, elected to remove it actually from the heritage register. So um, it's an unfortunate ending. This is an example of the interior of that house uh, with some beautiful woodwork. Um, and uh, unfortunately, it was completely all whitewashed. Normally, we don't sort of get involved in the interiors, discussions about the interiors, but this was a really spectacular house that um, just has no heritage character anymore. Um, 361 East Kings, uh, the before pictures on the left, kind of a cute cottage, also in the upper Lonsdale area, sits on a very large lot, was nicely treed. And despite uh, the best intentions of, of Nicole, um, we were unable to persuade the developer to retain the house and potentially make this the coach house and put in a bigger um, main house. And so what it's going to be replaced by, as you can see from this sign, is a three-level home, 6,000 square feet, three-car garage, swimming pool, sports court, and a putting green. And if you go up to that site now, it's under construction and there's virtually no trees left. So it's just been like decimated. 3075 from, we thought we might be able to move this to the good news side, but unfortunately not. Um, this is a beautiful heritage um, register home, sits in Lynn Valley. We, the homeowner did get involved in some discussions about uh, an HRA. A couple of years ago, um, even had a public um, open house. And um, he just heard too much um, negativity and thought it would be too difficult to process. Let it sit for a while, it's being rented, um, applied for a demolition permit, and Nicole was able to engage him again. And we thought we might be able to pull him through and hack activate the HRA. But unfortunately, we understand uh, the demolition permit is going to be issued on this house. 3635 Sunnycrest actually sits used to sit directly next to the Arthur Erickson Wedge House. It was an immaculate Fred Hollingsworth um, mid-century modern house, um, original condition. And um, although it did not sit on the Heritage Register, there was a, a lot of um, uh, support in keeping the house. And we really tried to persuade the um, new owner to retain it. Um, unfortunately, he he didn't see uh, the value of the heritage property. And uh, what you see at the bottom is what's replaced it, which is sort of a generic um, modern house. And um, as you can see from the picture at the right, it's it's very much sort of impinging on the light um, leading to the Arthur Erickson house. And uh, because it sits on a slope, it has a very big retaining wall again, which is very um, obvious from the street and, and unfortunate. Uh, 1202 Ross Road uh, sits in the middle of a big development um, area up in Lynn Valley and um, it is on the Heritage Register and unfortunately this is a good example of um, demolition by neglect. It's been sitting empty for a couple of years while they're trying to sell it and um, it's being kind of sold as a development property and um, yeah, every year that it sits um, exposed to the weather is not is not great for the house. 3712 uh, to 3718 Vermont Boulevard is a Fred Hollingsworth fourplex. It's one of the first fourplexes um, in, in um, Edgemont and um, it's uh, the, the the owner has tried to um, work with uh, district apparently to come to some sort of an agreement about a heritage um, revitalization agreement, and I believe um, that it's it hasn't been successful. And unfortunately, this is another example also of demolition by neglect, where the house is just um, not in great condition. And one one two zero Herald. Um, was another example of demolition by neglect. Again, it's not on the heritage register, but it does sit on a rather large lot up in Lynn Valley. And the good news about this um, address is that this uh, uh, 
a proposal came before us, our last council meeting after we put this presentation together where uh, an HRA is being proposed for this um, property. So we are um, optimistic that it will come to fruition. Um, and the last example of um, in our bad news is um, 2895 New Market. Again, this was a Allingsworth yeah. house. Um, beautiful, as you can see, the interior, beautiful um, post and beam house, uh, beautiful fireplace and um, an amazing garden. And um, it was, um, uh, we were unable to uh, get the owner to agree to retain it. Uh, it's been replaced by this big um, house on the bottom and the whole um, garden was uh, basically flattened. And um, actually the owner who bought the house and flat and demolished the house didn't even wasn't even the one to build it so unfortunately it was sold as a kind of a flat lot um so it would have been nice to have retained the house not allowed the demolition before the new building plans were put in place and i think um the policy has changed since then and you actually can't destroy a house before the new building plans um, are approved so that's I think it came out, out of this um, example. So as you can probably understand, we were quite sad that the um, sort of bad news outweighs the good news. We've got this great heritage strategic plan in place, and yet it doesn't seem to be yielding the results in terms of retention of, of heritage property. So we're, we're feeling a little bit frustrated, um, underutilized, um, yeah, in limbo and, and um, somewhat ineffective. Um, so we, we feel like there's a few issues, um, one of them probably around the HRA process. We don't feel like the process is um, so well defined for the average heritage homeowner who might want to know um, how to go about doing a heritage revitalization agreement. Um, there's also a lot of uncertainty regarding the outcome because it does end up in a public hearing. Obviously, you can't give guarantees and that creates uncertainty and it it some homeowners decide they just don't want to go down that road because they can't be guaranteed of the outcome. It also tends to be more costly and um, time consuming than in no, new build because um, of dealing with issues around code and just the general like public hearing process. And so um, that is a, a problem uh, with the current HRA process. And then finally, we feel the incentives are maybe insufficient to entice um, developers to uh, retain the heritage building. Um, the second issue is around demolition by neglect um, back to this property at 3712 um, uh, Edgemont. And unfortunately, I think uh, the, the District of North Vancouver cannot currently require a homeowner to maintain their property. And this has um, you know, led to a, a quite a few heritage register properties that have fallen into a state of disrepair um, that then makes it an easy argument to, to, to go for demolition as opposed to restoration. So um, we feel that's another um, issue that needs to be addressed. So, you know, what next? Um, how can our committee and the district in general be more successful with respect to um, heritage uh, properties? And so, you know, we ask ourselves, do we just continue to implement the heritage strategic plan? But then we wonder, well, will the outcome be any different? Um, so we feel like we need to address the fundamental issues that I just discussed um, within the HRA process, um, or we need to find an alternative alternative that doesn't require public hearing, that, that it is, isn't as extensive a process. And so, you know, our committee also feels like we could potentially do more of the work so we could um, implement the um, heritage strategic plan more quickly. So we don't just come to you with problems, we come to you with some possible solutions. And in terms of the um, issue around HRAs and incentives, um, we feel like there could be some additional incentives added, such as like fast tracking permits for heritage developments. Um, let them go to the front of the line so they're not um, waiting uh, extensively for permits. Um, and potentially maybe reduce or eliminate the permit fees that they, because it is quite an expensive process. Um, we feel like allowing stratification of heritage properties might be a really big incentive for someone to, to um, undertake an HRA when they know that they can stratify it um, at the end. Um, many heritage properties aren't deep enough to exempt the uh, FSR, all these 
big new houses that are going in have deep, deep, deep basements below grade, and they have all their FSR in the basement excluded or the square footage excluded from the FSR calculations. So why not allow a heritage um, homeowner to also, who wants to go through um, some kind of a development, um, eliminate the uh, basement square footage from the FSR calculations. And then finally, um, we feel like if we could encourage more coach house developments, um, because the coach house policy is quite restrictive, um, potentially that could be another incentive that would um, ensure um, yeah, the success of more heritage developments. Um, in terms of improving the HRA process, um, we'd like to see uh, the process documented and published on the website, potentially with cost estimates and timelines for each step, so people really have a better idea of what they're getting into um, when, they, when they start the process. Um, I know we've already moved towards this second bullet, which is providing some more detailed guidance to heritage homeowners. Um, but I do also know that, you know, when um, Nicole is in discussions with um, heritage homeowners about potential developments, um, she has to be careful about what she tells the homeowner to do or not to do, um, because, uh, you know, there's no guarantee that council will approve it at the end or that the neighbors, you know, may or may not um, like what, you know, what, what we're proposing. So, but we feel like maybe there could be more guidance and potentially more guarantees at the preliminary application stage. Um, not sure if that's possible, but food for thought. At least that would eliminate the un some of the unknowns. And then other, other solutions, um, again, uh, the $50,000 grant program that's just been implemented um, actually will pay for people to get a statement of significance leading towards a heritage designation so that their property is not just on the register, but it's actually legally designated and therefore better protected. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so the fact that people can get money to do that, and then once their house is designated, they're actually eligible for a greater amount of funds through that heritage grant program. So we'd like to see that more homes in the district um, designated. Um, we're not exactly sure how to do this, but we'd like to see, as I said, getting away from the public hearing process and potentially implementing some kinds of new zoning that, that maybe uh, favor coach or automatic approval of um, coach houses or on, on heritage properties or some kind of um, zoning that does not require a heritage homeowner to go through um, um, a public hearing. As well, we'd like to see a heritage maintenance bylaw implemented so that we can get away from this issue of demolition by neglect. Um, we would like to educate heritage homeowners and neighbors, especially about the value of heritage and, and what it adds to the community um, so that we don't end up with those kind of situations that we, we saw around 360 um, East Windsor. And then we'd like to promote heritage uh, properties with plaques, which is another way of educating um, neighbors and the general public on, on the value of um, heritage properties. So our questions to you, um, and we haven't mentioned sustainability, but it does go hand in hand with heritage. So obviously a heritage property that, or house that stays standing is one less house or house that, that goes to the landfill. So our questions are, are heritage and sustainability uh, important to you? And what is your appetite for um, increased incentives for um, HRAs? And is some kind of rezoning um, uh, a possibility? Would you support uh, heritage maintenance by law? And um, how do you think that the district uh, of North Vancouver can, um, can see better outcomes? And then just going hand in hand, what we'd like to see from the district is their commitment, recommitment, I should say, to heritage, um, a, a more rapid process for um, uh, developments concerning heritage properties, uh, flexibility and innovation, and that sort of more applies to um, yeah, thinking outside the box in terms of incentives and the process. And then ultimately, we'd like to see, of course, um, more successful outcomes. So uh, that is the end of our presentation. And this is a very goofy photo of <laughs> us from one of our Zoom meetings or Teams meetings. Um, and yeah, not sure if we have time to, to have a discussion or for you to address our questions or if that comes later or.
so um, first I'm going to uh, uh, move that the report of the Community Heritage Advisory Committee is received for information. Councillor Back, are you seconding that matter? Yeah, okay. And then uh, I've got uh, myself, Councillor Hanson, or Councillor Back, Councillor Hanson, on the speaking list. And um, I'm just going to make a quick comment about it. I mean, there's a lot of questions, obviously, in, in the package. We do have a full agenda tonight. What I'd like to propose is that we take those questions back, get better answers, and then I'm willing to come to your committee and uh, mm -hmm. meet with your committee, and then we can do back and forth uh, in, in that setting as well, where we have a lot more time to, to address it. Yeah. Um, uh, some of them are, are things that I think we can uh, do, and if there's willingness on the part of the committee to maybe uh, the $50,000 that we set aside, um, uh, I, I, I got to imagine that there's not going to be full annual pickup on those funds, but mm -hmm. if, there's a, if there's a way for us to be able to use them for other heritage purposes, maybe there's more flexibility that we could build into that policy and, and we could maybe... Uh, see about cutting some of the permit policies in half or something and have them mm. subsidized from that fund as, as permits allow something something else for a heritage purpose from that i think we probably could come up with that uh, but when it comes to this to the density side the, to whether one lot becomes two lots we're we're regimented by the province we, mm. we don't have a lot of flexibility in 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 those pieces so um uh, but what i'd like to do is come to your committee and we can talk about what we have the ability to do by policy what we can do just on our own uh, work and other things where we, we just don't have the express power from the provincial government. But uh, uh, I, I will have our office set that up as soon as we Excellent. can to come yeah. and, and present to your committee. We appreciate but, that. And we know you are restricted by the Local Government Act. Unfortunately, we're not, we don't know it so well that we can, you know, determine what, what where the restrictions are. But You have lots of good ideas in here that I think yeah. we, we'll be able to find good. some places we can work together. Councillor Back. Uh, I, thank you very much, Your Worship. I don't have too much to add to that if we're not going to get into actual uh, solutions tonight, but thank you very much for your presentation. I attended both of the tours that you were kind enough to organize for us. It did spark an interest in heritage in our community for me. Um, and I know when you talk about those three Lynn Valley addresses, I know them well. I walk past them all the time. So, it, you know, would love to be able to find solutions that would save these kinds of uh, homes. I was going to ask you about the example you shared uh, at 1160 Ridgewood, where the HRA was approved about 10 years ago, and then nothing has has really happened with it. Do you know um, why that would be, or, or what? Um, I'm not sure if they just didn't it. have the capital. I think there were some issues around um, uh, environmental issues around setbacks because the stream runs through there. I think there were some of those issues that need to be addressed, and then I think the owner just lost interest and maybe saw the market value going up and up and up and you know don't know i'm not sure if it, i don't think it changed hands okay um, but yeah it's unfortunate that mm -hmm. we don't have the power to say okay well you know what if the hr isn't implemented within a certain period of time and maybe that's something else we do um then 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 it it, it goes away Mm -hmm. And therefore, you, all your incentives go away. So that that actually is probably a good idea. Something we should investigate as so well. That's the thought I was. Yeah. That's what I was leading Thank to. You. Is that maybe it should have a, a date? Yeah. Um, we did not think about on, that. Yeah. On it. But, yeah. Um, yeah, excellent presentation and, and thank you for all of the ideas. I'm very supportive or at least want to look at uh, all of those solutions that you brought up. So thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you. Councillor Back, Councillor Hanson, followed by Councillor Forbes. Councillor Hanson. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for your presentation and uh, also very uh, supportive. And uh, I thought many of the ideas that you put uh, forward in this um, uh, presentation are ones that we can certainly look at. It does seem uh, based on the bad news that you uh, presented that the incentives indeed are insufficient uh, or else we wouldn't have had uh, all that uh, bad news. Just on the rezoning point, I mean, you uh, you raised the challenge, is rezoning a possibility? Uh, can you give us a little more idea what that um, uh, what you're suggesting there in terms of examples? And is there another local government that you can direct us yeah. to uh, that has pursued a rezoning a uh, strategy that, in your view, is successful? The example that I can think of is the city of North Vancouver, which I think uh, has zoned certain areas to allow both coach houses and basement suites um, automatically. And so, yes, this would apply not just to heritage homes, but it would apply to all homes. Of course, that's going to result in increased density. But that allows, um, as long as you've got the ability, you know, the FSR on, on your property to put in the coach house and then also have a basement suite, those are the kind of things that are appealing to um, somebody 
not just a heritage homeowner, but yes, definitely heritage homeowner. Um, because then they don't have to go through a public hearing. Um, but I do think the coach house, potentially the coach house um, policies need to be um, uh, made not more lenient, but that to, that that, that there sh they should be relaxed so that there can so it's not so restrictive. I think the her the coach house policy is potentially a little bit restrictive in terms of yeah the type of lot that that can accommodate a coach house. But that's the example I have for the city anyway of North. Thank Canada. you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Forbes. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you very much for that report. I found it really, really interesting. Um, I live sort of kitty corner to that one on Ridgewood probably 40 years ago, more than that, 45 years ago. And I just about cried when I saw that picture of what had happened to that house. Um, I guess what I, I have lots of questions and Mayor, please let me know when the meeting that you're going to let me know about it because I would like to come along. I have lots of questions about this, but I just want to ask you, um, is it is it neighborhood or neighbor pressure to not want um, a heritage home or is it the cost of the owner? Um, uh, it's probably a little bit of both, but which of those two is, do you think is the main defining thing that makes people go, okay, no, I'm not gonna do this. I think it's uh, possibly the cost and the process it, it, it's and, and the undetermined outcome or the not the unguaranteed outcome, maybe more so than, um, you know, the neighborhood discontent. Um, the thing about HRAs is they almost always involve increased density. And so, you know, if the neighborhood is opposed to um, increased density, then it, it becomes a problem. Um, but we're, we're only talking, I mean, technically, if they were situated right, um, a basement suite would add minimal increase. And then there's the coach house. Um, what what do you what kind of reason do neighbors um, not like it? Just the density because it's I mean well, it's density like and everything that comes with it, parking. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. So it wouldn't really matter if it was heritage or anything else. They just don't want change. <laughs> Probably <laughs> to a certain degree. Okay. All right. I find that puzzling because uh, the older homes with the gorgeous woodwork and wood floors and I just I don't know why anybody wouldn't want to preserve it but thank you very much appreciate they your are answer. costly to preserve so <laughs> and I think the neighbors are also torn because they want the heritage building to be properly maintained and restored they just don't want aren't, don't want more houses on their street to pay for it and right so right um uh, so I think when you go through the HRA process it was evident in the East King situation was uh um that uh um the neighborhoods don't see that as being a way to save the building. Uh, they, they see it as, well, what's the point of saving the building if you had to move it? It's not in its original setting, and we now have a busier street, and so they don't see it as a viable alternative. But right. uh, in, in some cases, it has been supported, as noted, that HRAs have been issued. But uh, Yeah, we uh, do have some good yeah, success stories, too. Councillor Kern. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank you for your presentation and was just kind of reflecting. And I think the, the last round got closer to that um, issue um, that we have to contend with across the municipality. So just looking at ways that we can um, have this conversation more broadly, because it's not just heritage properties. I think there's lots of opportunities um, throughout that um, that we can find some ands instead of ors. It seems like we're it, it, there's lots of. So I think that the stratification was really interesting and in some of the um, those specific um, asks that you had, I think, would be interesting to look at in the context of other places as well. And I know that it's never the Heritage um, Committee's uh, preference to have buildings torn down, but um, I'm always hoping that if that becomes the end, that they at least get deconstructed. Mm -hmm. And so working with unbuilders, and I'm sure you're aware of that. So seeing some of that wood, um, we a lot of the homes that are being torn down throughout Metro Vancouver are going into landfill and they're old growth forest, I mean, old, old growth wood. So um, 
that I know that's not where <laughs> you want to end up. No, we know. Yeah. End up there. Yeah. Um, I think that that's another piece that we're looking at is like what happens in terms of deconstruction. Um, but I think you, you've raised a lot of interesting um, points and solutions that we could look at um, that could apply here, but also more broadly as well. So thanks for your time. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Curran. Councillor Bond. Um, thank you, Mayor Little. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, the whole committee worked very hard on it. Um, one thing I think, uh, perhaps for Council, is that uh, the committee has come forward with a bunch of ideas, uh, and I think it would be useful because the committee is basically creating a, a, their own work plan for these ideas, because I, I expect that Council will likely send these ideas back to the committee and, and have the committee work on flushing some of these ideas out. Uh, more. So I think it would be useful for the committee. Uh, it doesn't have to happen now, but of those ideas that were presented, um, uh, we can do this you know, after the meeting uh, via email, uh, which ones are, is council at least supportive of the committee spending volunteer time on and, and staff time. We have, you know, we have staff liaison and hopefully there will be a, a heritage of full-time staff person, but, you know, exploring ideas around, these ideas about zoning or whether it's about heritage conservation areas or maintenance bylaws obviously is more time than the staff liaison has to do right now. So uh, if council is supportive or not supportive of, of those some of these ideas, I think that would be help kind of narrow the committee's focus. And then kind of if there's a, if there's a standout idea that council uh, really wants and is really supportive of pursuing um, having that feedback going back to the committee so that they can uh, focus their work and then bring kind of uh, a more uh, detailed proposal in terms of whether it's an incentive or, or, or back to council for, for further discussion. So maybe that's something we can do after the meeting or we can have staff coordinate that. Yeah, I, I, thank you, Councillor. I, I think that um, we probably, some of the questions we should probably get some staff advice on first and then, um, uh, but I, I agree, it's a great way to frame the next stage of the conversation and, uh, um, you know, to sort of set about what council's willing to do and then go back to the committee and, and see what, where there's concurrence. Um, I think that's reasonable. Um, Mayor Little, would, would you want a motion to that effect or can that be taken as staff direction to, um, to explore these ideas and come back with a, a information report to council? We, we have a motion on the floor that um, just receives the information. Um, I don't know that we need a, a council motion to that effect, but you know what, let's, let's do that. So let's, let's have you, uh, um, uh, as soon as I'm done with this motion, yeah. uh, then I'll ask for a follow-up motion, uh, but the basic nature of which would be that staff report back to council on, uh, on the, the presentation from, yeah. from the committee. Okay. I see no further speakers at this time. So I have a call question on the first motion. This is just simply on receipt. All those in favor, contrary minded, motion carries. Councillor Bond, you have a follow-up motion? Yep, just move that staff report back to council on the ideas presented in the presentation. Thank you, happy to second that. Call a question on the motion. All those in favor, contrary minded, motion carries. I guess uh, just my final comments, the challenge for Heritage, I used to be the chair of the Heritage Commission back in the day, and. And the challenge is going to be uh, when you can get $3.5 million on a spec house, uh, when you can split up a lot and get uh, uh, you know, millions of dollars more out of it, uh, the target is going to be in the back of heritage in our community going forward. We have to be uh, cunning in how we respond and try to bring in uh, advantages to help push people in a direction of retaining this important part of our culture. But at the same time, uh, we're up, to, up against some very, very big financial rewards than to uh, draw a lot of people who are not fans to heritage, in heritage into the market. And that makes it very difficult for an advocacy committee like yours to be able to sell the benefits of heritage in the community. So, so you have our appreciation. Uh, we thank you all for, uh, for volunteering on the committee and for uh, doing the incredible work that you do. Uh, but uh, it's 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 going to take some creative uh, responses in order to be able to address this challenge. Of course, the positive news is that uh, Erickson Home, or yeah, the Erickson Home, the Wedge House that sold for three point four million dollars, which yeah. is more you know more than a new build on a similar size lot, very small lot. So that is very positive. We'll have to tell that story. Well, the, the house exactly. that I live in was uh, was a heritage home that was picked up and had something built underneath it and dropped back down, and so. 
while it's not a perfect heritage restoration, it still keeps the elements of the original uh, farmhouse that was on, on the property and does it without uh, having to destroy or move the home out of the space. So, um, uh, so there are alternatives out there. Yes. Thank you so much Thank for your Thank you presentation. for your time and, and yeah, points. Okay, the next item we have is uh, item 8.2. This is the development variance permit for um, uh, for 1755 Lionsgate Lane, 2020 to 2042 Curling Road and 1865 to 1883 Fullerton Avenue. Uh, I believe we have a comment from staff first. Thank you, your worship. I have a brief introduction. Um, your worship and members of council as a brief overview of this application, Five Star Permits has applied on behalf of the property owners to allow for the installation of signage on the properties at 1755 Lionsgate Lane, 2020 to 2042 Curling Road, and 1865 to 1883 Fullerton Avenue. These are the buildings at the heart of the Lionsgate Village Centre. <clears throat> the subject properties are part of a larger mixed-use development spanning just under five acres in area, which includes residential and commercial uses, a storage facility, the community center and the public plaza. The site sits adjacent to the Greenway Trail to the west, which is a pedestrian and bicycle path that connects the site to other parks and plaza spaces in the area. The proposed sign package recognizes the mix of uses on the site and works to address wayfinding for residents, members of the public and emergency responders by directing them toward the private and public components of the development. The proposed signage variances accommodate a variety of freestanding directional signs. These are signs that allow pedestrians to find their way around the site and also freestanding directory signs. These are signs that provide building name and address information. The variances to the sign bylaw proposed in the application include the maximum height and area of signage and the number of signs on a single lot, as well as the proximity of signs to property lines and to other signage on the same lot. The proposal reflects the intent of the Lower Capilano Village Center Implementation Plan, the Lionsgate Village Public Realm Design Guidelines, and the OCP's Form and Character Development Permit Guidelines. The signage will provide support for pedestrians, cyclists, and transit users accessing the site, and the sign designs incorporate pedestrian scale lights to improve the pedestrian experience. Development permit 2120 to accommodate the sign package with variances is recommended for issuance this evening. And that concludes my introduction to this item. Okay, I'll be moving the staff recommendation. Is there a seconder on the matter? Councillor Back, I see your hand first. Uh, so my own comments on it. Uh, you know, when we had the discussion about, uh, particularly in the neighboring Marine Drive area, about uh, going on a sign diet, really, uh, trying to limit the amount of signs that were in uh, some of the public spaces, it was more or less meant to address large commercial signs in there that uh, were really quite imposing and uh, really more focused on promoting one particular specific business. Uh, I think that these uh, proposals are focused on wayfinding and helping people be, get around the facility. I think that's a reasonable uh, variance on this, uh, uh, on our sign package. And so I will be supportive of the issuance here. Councillor Back. Uh, yes, you, um, I would just, just add that I, I agree. And I think uh, the types of signage, as you say, is uh, more for wayfinding. It's a, of a smaller scale. Um, and I think as we create a town center here, this is really focus of the, the plaza. So I think the signs and the wayfinding are an important component of that. So I support it. Thank you. I see no other hands from council at this time. Call the question, oh, Councillor Forbes. Sorry, thank you, your worship. I thought I would probably be behind someone when I just clicked on. I just have a question. Um, this is the first time something like this has come up uh in this term and so i'm just curious um is this is this usual or because i haven't even seen this before i was a counselor that one one i one entity uh on behalf of another entity talks about signage all around a particular development or is it just because this development is pretty much enclosed 
not enclosed, but it's pretty capsulated. Mr. Hartford. Um, your worship, through you to Councillor Forbes. We did have another similar example of this with the Lynn Valley Town Center come through within the last year. Um, under the sign bylaw, variances to the sign bylaw are handled through a minor development permit process that must be considered by council. Um, you are correct that this is arising because of the large scale nature of this development. And in this case, the signage application is being made by a sign company on behalf of the owners of the property. It's just that some of the elements of this town center include public features like the community center. I was, my only comments would be then that um, I'm not against wayfinding, but I think that the general public uh, in the signs, when I try to blow them up and make them bigger, I don't think there's any signage pertaining to the trail along the river. And there's not any signage directing to the community center down there. So I think those two things would be important for general public that don't live within the, that, that area. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hartford, I'd, I'd be surprised if the directory didn't address directing people to the community center. Is that not contemplated? Um, Your Worship, there is reference to community center uh, location within the signage package. There is not specific reference to the um, riverfront trail because that is off site from this site. Okay. okay. Thank you. I see no further speakers from Council. Call the question on the motion. All those in favor? Contrary minded, motion carries. Thank you very much, Council. Next item up for business is the uh, bylaw 8510 multifamily rental housing demolition notice bylaw 7406. And this is the 2003 repeal bylaw. Uh, this matter is up for adoption. Just to refresh Council, this was, this was repealed in order to bring the R trap into place. Uh, and so now that our trap is in place, this needs to be officially uh, adopted if that is council's wish. Uh, so this matter is up for adoption, no further discussion. I'm going to call the question, sorry, I'll, I'll move the motion. And is there a seconder on the motion? I see Councillor Bond first, okay. I'll call the question, all those in favor? Contrary minded, motion carries. Next item up for discussion is item 8.4. This is the 2020 to 2023 tax exemptions by council uh, bylaw 8379-2019, amendment bylaw 8522-2021, amendment number two. Uh, council, uh, this is uh, put forward for uh, first, second, and third reading. Are there any comments from staff? I think we do have some finance staff on the call. Uh, uh, Elio Iorio, are you, uh, can you have any opening comments on the matter? Uh, Your Worship, Amendment Bylaw 8522 presented for council consideration provides recommendation for permissive tax exemption for the years 2022 and 2023 for one property held by the Canadian Mental Health Association, North and West Vancouver branch, as reviewed by the members of the Community Services Advisory Committee. The property included in this amendment bylaw is utilized to provide housing and services for up to six women in the community who are in need of supportive housing. Based upon the committee recommendation to grant a permissive tax exemption to this agency provides an estimated $3,820 in municipal tax exemption that can be repurposed for additional support services by the agency. Inclusive of exemptions pre previously approved by Council in 2019, a total of $457,540 in permissive tax exemptions is estimated for the 2022 taxation year. Per the taxation exemption by Council guidelines, the 2022 taxes exempted are within the limits of the financial cap of 0.6% of the municipal tax levy amounting to $654,000, leaving approximately 196,000 in cap space available for future utilization. 
Okay, thank you, Mr. Iorio. Just, just to be clear then, so the reason why this one is being considered on its own is because it is the only new one being considered this year. Other ones have been considered in the annual allotment. Is that correct? That's correct. This is the only new application for 2022. Thank you very much. Councillor Forbes, you have a motion? Oh, you're muted. Councillor, you're muted, Darren. Thank you, Worship. Um, I just had a question, but I'll also move the motion, the staff recommendation then, because okay, I support is there, this. Is there a seconder on the motion? Okay, seconded by Councillor Hansen. Councillor Forbes, go ahead. I just had a question on this. Um, I think it's great that we're able to do this and that this private home is uh, able to be used in this way. It benefits, it's a win-win for, uh, it's a win-win-win for the district, for the women, for the homeowner. I just had a question that it says that, I, I was wondering how many other of these type of arrangements that we have. I know there's only two other homes in the district, if I understand that right, but is this typically the kind of agreement that we make with a homeowner? Uh, through your worship, Councillor Forbes, uh, the community charter uh, is in compliant to allow leasehold properties to be provided a permissive tax exemption if council so commits to. Okay, that wasn't quite my question, but um, I just wondered how it, it got to the front, to how it got to us, that's all. But it's okay, I can talk to you later. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think just the nature of it is, is it's uh, uh, we're allowed to partner with agencies for pers permissive tax exemption. It's a nonprofit organization that'll be administering the property. And so uh, uh, similar to some of the other properties on our council selected property tax exemption, it's partnering agreement. It's effectively a, a way of doing a grant in lieu to support those organizations um, in, in their operations in the, within the district. But uh, uh, thank, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Councilor Brack, you were this, or sorry, Councilor Hanson, you were the second on the motion. Any further comments? No, thank you very much. Thank you. Any other members of council wishing to comment on the matter? Hearing none, I'll call a question on the motion. All those in favor, contrary minded. Motion carries. I will just say uh, as closing on this item, uh, last Friday, we were able to do the uh, uh, North Shore Community Foundation Mayor's Tournament for Golf, uh, partnered with the City of North Vancouver, in which we raised about $50,000 for the Canadian Mental Health Association to help support their operations here in the municipality. Uh, uh, Josh and, and Julia Kozla do a great job giving leadership to that organization, very happy to support their initiatives in our community. Uh, the next item we have up is item 8.5. This is the extension of temporary outdoor business areas to October 2022 uh, for the purposes of COVID-19 recovery. We have Representative Mr. Milburn. Uh, you're going to make some opening remarks on the matter. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, members of Council, good evening. Uh, just very briefly, uh, the provincial government uh, announced a potential extension uh, to the allowances for uh, temporary outdoor business areas. In, in the case of the province, it's licensed areas that they are focused on. Uh, the District of North Vancouver has a number of these areas, 26, uh, that have been authorized both on private and public lands. Um, uh, with that extension provided by the province, the opportunity is there for the district to also extend the allowance for these temporary outdoor business areas to support businesses who are having uh, challenges with responding to and recovering from COVID-19 and the various limitations on um, uh, that are placed on them with respect to um, access as well as proximity of customers to each other. So at this point, staff is recommending a further extension beyond October 31st, 2021 uh, to June 1st, 2022. The other important point to note is, is this is a, is a final opportunity for these temporary extensions, but will give a, an opportunity for these businesses to prepare possibly permanent requests uh, that then can come forward uh, to staff um, and council uh, for review and consideration to support them in their future uh, efforts to respond to COVID-19. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions, Council. Thank you, Mr. Milburn. I'll be moving the recommendation. Councillor Back, are you seconding? Thank you very much. Uh, just my comments on the matter. Uh, happy to extend this. Uh, I, I noted that in the uh, public input, uh, uh, one of the residents pointed out that uh, some of these items may or may not need to be first, second, and third all in one go. 
I know from hearing from the business community, they are really eager to get this sorted out because it is October <laughs> and, and they really want to, uh, uh, to know what they're, how they're going to be able to act going forward. And so this matter should be expedited to some degree. The longer term discussion, which I think has to take place is that some of these measures have been quite popular. People like that we've been using more of the space. And in other cases, uh, because of the uh, imposition on uh, some parking space, it's caused some stress between some neighbors. And, but uh, I, I am eager to have the longer term discussion because I think we can re-envision how we reallocate some space around these businesses for the uh, benefit of consumers and our residents. But uh, at the same time, uh, at this point, I'm happy to extend a temporary extension uh, for the purposes of responding to COVID. Councillor Back. Thank you, Mary Little. Yes, very happy to uh, support the extension of these temporary business areas as well. Um, in speaking with uh, several of these businesses, uh, this was very, very much appreciated and in some cases a lifeline uh, for these small businesses to get through uh, the pandemic with reduced capacity in their indoor areas and, and being able to offer that uh, areas for social distancing. So um, very happy to support this and also would be supportive of that conversation about how we look at these in the future um, because I think maybe there are some issues with uh, parking that's been reduced, but I think large, by and large, uh, this has been a very positive thing. Um, so, and also I would just encourage staff to really reach out to these businesses that are uh, taking advantage of the temporary patios and, and educating them, help them through the process of applying for a more permanent patio if that's the route that uh, they want to go. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I have uh, Councillor Curran next. Councillor Curran. Thanks. Uh, also very happy to support this. Also um, can uh, have heard from some of the businesses that are concerned because they're trying to plan um, into the winter um, season. So I think they'll certainly appreciate us moving this along. Uh, I would say there's always going to be um, just concerns around accessibility. I know um, when we're taking over sidewalks, for example, um, we can impact people who have mobility devices and we need to be really mindful um, of that. But as far as using um, space for people instead of cars, I am here for it. So I can't wait for that conversation to um, carry on. And I think um, hopefully people have been able to, you know, enjoy that um, in, in er various areas in the district um, and around. I think it's been really great when we did it in the Cove, it was met with, I think, a lot of concern. And some of the same people that maybe weren't, weren't so agreeable are sitting there toasting with their friends now <laughs> outside. So I think it's been a real um, success and I look forward to, you know, implementing policy that will make it fair because um, it is, you know, that's something we'll have to look at down the line. But I say, um, let's move it forward. Thank you very much. I see no further speakers on the matter. The call to question, all those in favor, contrary minded, motion carries. Next item up discussion, uh, for discussion is the amendments to the council procedures bylaw. Just as a bit of an intro on this item. So the council has been operating in the last uh, uh, largely year and a half uh, under what was called Medical Health Order 192, which was a provincial mandate that said that uh, uh, in order to be able to respond to COVID, we, we allow all municipalities to conduct their business in these different ways in order to be able to make it so that the meetings can work and respond to uh, to um, uh, the inability to have members of the public present. We've obviously been able to alter some of our procedures to allow hybrid opportunities for people to present in person and virtually. But we end up in this bit of a strange void where the medical health orders came up at the end of September and we weren't really allowed to bring in new measures until this point. And so for the October 4th meeting, the October 12th meeting, and I believe it's the October 18th meeting, uh, we're actually under the pre-COVID rules for meeting as a council, which is why we have so many members of council in person here tonight, uh, which I, I do appreciate everybody coming out uh, uh, despite the challenges that COVID presents. Um, and what that means is that we, uh, one of our uh, um, procedures specifically was that we had to achieve quorum in person pre-COVID. And uh, so some of the issues that are presented here before you today, some of which are, uh, are, are yet are, um, look substantial, 
um, are done in order to be able to uh, carry forward some of the things that we think work rather well during uh, the MH192 period. Uh, they're not intended to limit public interaction in any way. They're not intended to uh, you know, uh, make the virtual experience any different from the in-person experience. That is still a priority for our council to make sure that the uh, that people feel welcome both in person and online, and that the experience for people participating in both of those ways is as equitable as we reasonably can make it. Uh, because we love it that the community comes out and has shares their opinions on, on, on matters. We want you to feel welcome. That's what these amendments are intended to address. I'm now going to turn it over to Mr. Gordon, the clerk, uh, to for further comments from his perspective. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, not much more to add. Uh, that was an excellent summary of the situation. Uh, I will note, though, that there are a few, while well, we're in there doing um, these amendments, there's a few additional non-COVID related uh, items that uh, are either requested by Council or put there for Council's consideration. I believe the report was fairly comprehensive, so I'll respond to specific questions, Your Worship, if there are any. Okay. I uh, see, uh, Councillor Forbes, you have your hand up. Do you have a motion? I'm going to need you to unmute. Sorry, sorry, I keep forgetting tonight. I, I would like to, I would like to amend the staff's recommendation and only have it at first reading because this is new to the rest of council and there's a there is a number of things in there that aren't covid related necessarily they're they're adding policies and procedures so i would really like to maybe have uh, a work a short presentation or workshop or some ability for us to discuss some of the uh things that are in here so i'd like it just to go for first reading tonight Okay, and I, I understand that, but the challenge being that until we get these in, I know you're participating virtually, until we get these matters resolved, or at least the ones that pertain to uh, the composition of a meeting and when we have an official meeting, um, everybody else will have to keep coming out in person uh, in order to make those meetings effectively quorum. And so uh, I, I guess what I would, encourage you to do is maybe do first, second, and third reading for the ones that have, that are, that are, um, uh, that permit uh, virtual participation. And then maybe we can bifurcate and separate out ones that are separate. Mr. Gordon, you, you have uh, uh, some information on that? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, no, the way the bylaw is structured as a unit, uh, we can't, at this point, can't pick and choose. We would have to come back with another bylaw that uh, dealt specifically with a package or a group of resolu of um, amendments. Okay. So what, could, I, uh, could, I just, could I just say, Your Worship, that I'm not attending not because I don't want to. I'm not attending because I had no guarantee that everybody would keep their masks on, including while they're speaking, and I have immunodeficiency problems, so that's why yeah. I'm not there. Yeah, I'm not trying to call you out, Councillor Ford. I'm just saying that we're going to have difficulty functioning going forward because I think you're not the only member of council who would prefer to be participating virtually at this time. And but I we, we do to be have, there. Yeah, we do have some challenges with um, uh, with meeting quorum under our old rules. What I'm going to recommend then is that uh, Councillor Forbes has indicated she intends to advance uh, first reading. Uh, is, is it fair, Mr. Gordon, then, if a majority of the council would uh, is interested in, per, in passing the entire package through second and third reading, that someone else could put forward second and third reading after first reading, and then Councillor Forbes doesn't have to vote for it moving to second and third reading? Is that is that a fair way to address the matter? Uh, and we, we always have the ability at a future date to revise the council procedures bylaw, with the exception of until we get the the virtual guidelines set up, uh, we're, we're in a bit of a trap. Uh, on that point, you're correct, Your Worship. We're, we're stuck with a quorum physically present until we can make these amendments. Um, and uh, for, I wanted to say also that um, I could give a more detailed presentation if to address Councillor uh, Forbes's questions, if uh, you would like, or if she has specific questions, uh, the opportunity is before us now to dig into that in a little more detail. 
And as to uh, a motion, um, certainly a, a, rec or a motion for first reading would require a seconder. Uh, if that were to fail, um, another councillor could perhaps move three readings. Okay. Or, and that's more straightforward. Or as you did say, um, we could go through the, um, I think, additional steps of first reading, second vote, and then second and third on top of that. Uh, if there's a majority that wants three readings tonight, um, you know, might as well just get on with it. But there is an opportunity to discuss uh, any issues that uh, any of the councillors may have. I'm available to, to speak to that. Councillor Forbes has moved first reading. Is there a seconder for first reading alone? Okay, I don't see a seconder for that. And so I'm going to move uh, the staff recommendation, which is first, second, and third reading of the matter, seconded by Councillor Hansen. Is there any other discussion on first, second, and third? Councillor Forbes, your hand is still up. Do you have a... Okay. Uh, I will just say, uh, you know, like I said in the introduction, this is this. Uh, there are some elements that are in here that are additional to the emergency procedure, specifically, you know, when matters come back to council so that a matter that is defeated by council is not continually returning to council. So that's just a good governance piece, I think, in order to be able to make sure that other new business is an opportunity to hit the floor uh, at the council. Um, but um, uh, again, it's a living document. Uh, when we, even if we pass these, if we find out after the fact that there are elements of it we don't like, just like we're doing tonight, we can amend the bylaw in order to be able to better address the concerns of the council going forward. Councillor Hanson. Thank you very much, Your Worship. I, I, I wonder if Mr. Gordon could just very briefly uh, run through it, hit the highlights. Uh, that might be uh, might might allay certain concerns and. Uh, we would uh, have a better sense of uh, the public would have a better sense of the changes. I think we're making good straight. progress tonight, Mr. Gordon. Uh, can you maybe perhaps go through and and read through the items and I, I certainly think you're just hitting the highlights. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, I can, Your Worship, and I'll refer to the summary on the first page of the report uh, and just um, scan down that and perhaps add the additional comment, any additional comments that uh, might be worthwhile that aren't mentioned in the report. Uh, there are 11 amendments, and as we said earlier, some are specifically related to um, the new powers granted under the community charter that make up for the um, emergency order over the summer that has been uh, rescinded by the province. Uh, and some, as the mayor uh, referred to, are uh, in the uh, procedural interest of council, if council uh, sees fit to adopt, to adopt these. Uh, the first one is uh, bringing some, there's two here, uh, the first one bringing some clarification to the application of the council procedure bylaw to the advisory committees and committees of council. Uh, it's quite clear in the community charter that the, uh, the charter itself and the council procedure bylaw does apply to those bodies, uh, committees of council and advisory committees, bodies, task forces. Um, but for the benefit of readers of the procedure bylaw and clarity for those committee members, uh, we would just like to enhance some of the wording in uh, section 3A, the first proposed amendment, um, where the procedure bylaw reads as applying to council and it's inferred, it, you know, replace mayor with chairman, replace council with committee. We're just making that explicit. Um, it's, we went with it being inferred for many years. For clarity, we're just going to make that statement uh, right up front. Um, and I'm going to just jump ahead to the third amendment on the list in the summary item, or section 7.1. Uh, this is a new section on providing notice of those committee meetings. Um, there is a section already in the procedure bylaw on um, notice of council meetings and notice of committee of the whole meetings. Uh, we are currently not actively using committee of the whole, but um, even though the same procedure as notice for council meeting applies to committee meetings, we're going to make that explicit and give notice of committee meetings its own section. So that's uh, 7.1, so um, the third amendment. Just going to back up to um, the number two, an amendment to section five. Uh, I find this an interesting one. Uh, this is deletes a requirement that all council meetings be held uh, in the district hall and within the municipality. Uh, the, there's a flexibility by in the community charter to either 
on a one-off basis, have a resolution to hold a meeting outside of the municipality, or by bylaw, it can be done on a standing basis. The interesting part of this is with uh, virtual meetings, uh, we could have a councillor on Vancouver Island, a councillor in Kelowna, a councillor in Whistler, a councillor in Burnaby, uh, and then there's our quorum outside of the municipality, which in a virtual meeting setting, we may not necessarily be aware of where that councillor is participating from. So we think it's probably wise to, in order to avoid inv accidentally invalidating a meeting where potential important decisions will be made, uh, just to, to clarify that. Uh, so uh, an interesting- I would say the only time that that came into play was we had an emergency meeting take place while we were at uh, a UBCM, or sorry, a, an FCM, FCM convention. And, uh, and it became a question of whether it could constitute a meeting because the majority of council was actually at a convention, um, and but it was an emergency measure. So I, that that's the kind of situation. It's not uh, an ongoing. Traditionally, yes, a, a one-off was the nature of that. Uh, but as I said, with the virtual meetings these days, uh, we're not sure where that quorum may reside. So, uh, on a server in Silicon Valley somewhere, I suspect. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so uh, quickly moving along, not to take too much time on this. Um, uh, amendment number five, section uh, 12E. This is just bringing some clarification to the release of closed meeting decisions. This is just clarifying the wording of the mayor's authority in his at his discretion. Uh, if something is deemed no longer to be confidential, the mayor has the authority to authorize staff to release that to the public. Um, I'll refer to, if you're looking at the list on the front page of the report, uh, item six, the amendment to section 22C, which is uh, a replacement for signing up to speak at regular meetings. Um, uh, the ninth amendment, 41B, which is a sign up process for uh, committee of the whole. And number 11, a new sign up procedure for speaking at public hearings. These are uh, essentially the same wording. This is uh, the new sign-up process that evolved through uh, through the pandemic with virtual meetings. And this was uh, through the notice of meeting that is published, asking people interest to, interested in, pub, in providing public input to contact the clerk in advance. Uh, so, and that allows a balance, an e equality between virtual speakers and in-person speakers. So, and the deadline is uh, 3 p.m. the day of the meeting. Agendas are published on the Tuesday, six days prior to the meeting, and the deadline will be 3 p.m. the day of the meeting. So there's a window to contact the, uh, the clerk uh, or the deputy clerk uh, to sign up in advance. And uh, that's been working. I think council would probably agree so, uh, pretty well so far. So that's what those three sections are. And then we're just about done. We have two sections on uh, which His Worship referred to um, a one-year restriction on the return of defeated resolutions or bylaws. And uh, that's to avoid things just vexatiously coming back unless they're substantially different from the initial proposal. Uh, but really it's to allow uh, the very busy, of, busy schedule of council to proceed without being cluttered um, unnecessarily or perhaps vexatiously with things being returned that have been uh, clearly dealt with already by council. Um, most importantly, uh, fourth on the list there, an amendment to section eight, which is a complete replacement of the electronic meeting, um, uh, electronic meeting criteria. And this is in response to uh, new or amendments to the community charter and the local government act, which essentially now put in legislation what was previously in the emergency orders. And this is what allows us to have virtual meetings. Uh, so that section was very carefully put together to conform to uh, some pretty complicated uh, sections of the legislation, but that's the core of electronic meetings, which allow everything from a 100% virtual meeting to a 100% in-person meeting, but we're saying 99% of the time, it'll be a hybrid somewhere in between. There'll be one or more members of council staff or the public uh, attending uh, electronically. And I believe, uh, yes, your worship, uh, sorry that took so long, but I believe that's everything. 
probably a little more than an than a, uh, overview, but uh, that's everything in some detail. I think the other material item would be that um, uh, a desire by the council to have regular routine reporting from the committees. Oh, yes. Uh, that was another one that we thought had some materiality to it, and that is that uh, the council has made it an objective to try to have a closer relationship with the committees of council, and so this is an effort to make sure there's an ongoing dialogue with our committees. Uh, yes, thank you for pointing that out, Your Worship. That was the last one I overlooked. Uh, it just provides three options for committees. Committees can request to come to council. Council can ask a committee to come forward. Uh, but at a minimum, there's a. Uh, it says annually for um, that count committees should appear before council. We've got a lot of committees, so we'll see how that shakes out in terms of actually being manageable to have each come uh, annually. Thank you, Mr. Gordon. Councillor Kern. Um, thanks. I just had a, a comment and a quick question. Um, so comment is that I just wanted to share that um, I attended a day long disability justice workshop on Sunday. And for um, a lot of folks who experience disabilities, this has created um, in electronic participation has created entirely new opportunities for participation. Um, and I don't think we talk about that a lot or hear about that a lot. So I thought that was really important. Um, and, uh, and and actually throughout the pandemic, when things were moving to Zoom, people in the disability community were saying, we've been saying this for years and years and years, that there's other ways to do this. And it wasn't um, something that was considered until it was um, people, uh, other people who, who could participate that way. So I think there's definitely an equity consideration. Um, and then I just wanted to clarify, because watching some something in Vancouver, which I'm not sure if that was because of their unique charter, there, they have a community um, or a committee that was not able to meet virtually when the public health order um, went ended. Um, and I, I believe on ours, I know the AOC, like we've said that we want participation in our committees to be, but it was a, it was a legislative issue where they were petitioning the province, the city of Vancouver, to allow them to allow their committees. So I just wondered, are we some, is that different there than for us or just just basically the point being that our committees and our council have the opportunity to participate electronically because I think that is an equity um, piece for for people. There's there's two committees, uh, Mr. Burden, that would have separate legislation that governs that be your board of variance and the municipal library. I believe they have some other um, uh, legal constraints under which they meet that may be what it is is making sure that those have the same opportunity as a regular meeting of council uh, a regular committee of council uh, I can't think of any restrictions that prevent any of those bodies from meeting just like we're trying to achieve with council that full range of hybrid or 100% virtual if necessary and that would include the library board and uh, certainly uh, the board of variants as well so our council procedures affect how they meet, and so we can Okay, alter yeah, so I did see that chairs. specifically listed. Um, that wasn't just council, it was all committees, but for some reason there was a big controversy in Vancouver surrounding that, so I was just wondering if that was unique to their charter or what, but it sounds like we're good, so. Well, if you can find more information about which specific committee, we'll make sure that ours line up as well. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Back. Thank you, Madam. Um, thank you for the updates, uh, Mr. Gordon. And I would just uh, kind of to piggyback on what Councillor Curran said, it's uh, it certainly opened up accessibility for uh, meetings, for public hearings, uh, for members of the public to be able to just log on and participate in that way, I think has uh, really been a very much a positive of, of the pandemic. So I'm very supportive to see us go in this direction. I think the hybrid meetings are are working fairly well so far. This is my first time back in the chamber in, in quite a while, but uh, thank you to staff for all the work that they've done to get everything set up and, and make this all work. But I think this this is a positive change to uh, to the procedure bylaws and the way that we uh, in include the public going forward. Thank you, Councillor Back. I see no further speakers on the matter. All the question, all those in favor, contrary minded. Motion carries with Councillor Forbes opposed. Uh, yeah, just uh, my last comment on that same matter that Councillor Back raised is uh, I sit on the Advisory Committee for Disabilities Issues and they certainly uh, have uh, been supportive of the virtual uh, participation which we through AOC have been committed to. Uh, and also on our regular council meetings, it's been great to see different 
uh, people participate as well as the people we love to see in person as well. But uh, like tonight as an example, we have 22 additional attendees uh, participating virtually. And uh, I think that's, that's fantastic. I think that's something we certainly want to keep our foot on the gas on and make sure that people feel welcome to participate however it suits their lifestyle. Okay, Council, moving on to item uh, 8.7. Uh, this is a, a rezoning uh, bylaw 1411, bylaw 8524, rezoning for two lot subdivision at 4320 Prospect Road. Uh, comments from planning staff? Uh, oh, your Worship, I have. Sorry, uh, before I go to you, Mr. Hartford, we do have a speaker signed up to speak to the matter, and so I have... Uh, James Stobie, uh, yes, and I see you, you're participating electronically. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, yes. Welcome, you have three minutes to address the council. Uh, and I can share screen? Okay, perfect. Uh, you guys can all see this? Yes. Perfect. Um, good evening, Your Worship, councillors and staff. My name is James Stobie, and I'm here to represent uh, Bob Karshoot, uh, with regards to the proposed rezoning and subdivision at 4320 Prospect Road. <laughs> Our intention is to subdivide the current RS1 zone property into two RS3 zone properties. It was originally submitted in uh, 2016 uh, by Ken Clark and Synthesis Design submitted a detailed application in June of 2018. Uh, the property is currently zoned in RS1 and our intention, is to, as I mentioned, is to zone RS3. Uh, currently there are 20 properties highlighted uh, blue represents RS1 and the orange highlights uh, RS3 properties. The RS3 zone properties are currently in a minority and considering the size of uh, the uh, current RS1, uh, the actually is a bit of a misnomer as it doesn't comply with the lot area minimums. Uh, once the subdivision is approved, there'll be uh, 21 properties, um, which will be RS3, including our subject property. Uh, the proposed rezoning of the pro property size keeps within the context of the surrounding neighborhood and uh, we've previously approved subdivisions towards the south. It was agreed in the, with the planning department in 2018 that a shared driveway was the most appropriate way to access the two new properties. It reduces the curb cuts, it mitigates the burden of additional cars on existing easement, and it forced the proposed building footprints to be located towards the front of the property and towards the lower portions of the site. Building height-wise, um, I'm actually going to use uh, Lot 1 as our uh, example due to the worst-case scenario of it. By locating the house towards the front, we lower the new main floor elevation to five and a half feet, lower than the, the existing house. This is highlighted by the uh, light blue. As shown the flat roof, we're two and a half feet lower than the peak of the existing house. Um, for a new house with three and 12 slope uh, roof, the maximum allowed would be less than six inches, uh, be lower than the current roof peak. So um, from our roof peak, uh, this is actually an image of uh, the neighboring property behind. And um, our roof peak is actually gonna be six feet lower than the existing main floor at 4302 uh, Prospect Road. Image on the left shows the current view line at 4302. Uh, additional height increases would be compliant with additional North Ham zoning bylaw. Uh, existing house at 4320 currently does not restrict the views of the neighboring houses and the proposed new houses will have less impact on the view lines. Uh, there are eight trees to be removed, uh, uh, well, eight trees at the front of the property that are going to be removed due to conflict with the proposed driveway, the building envelope, or poor tree conditions. There are additional eight trees towards the rear of the house, <laughs> conflict with the stormwater management plan and poor conditions. Four of these trees in the back are actually uh, dying, uh, and the group relies heavily on each other for stability and shouldn't be retained in their individual nature. Now I understand tree removal is a very delicate subject. Um, the tree removal and planting plans have been completed in conjunction with the environmental department and uh, with five smart guidelines in place. Uh, there are 18 new trees. Uh, due to the fire hazard requirements of all new trees have to be deciduous. And we worked with Diamond Head Consulting to generate a plan that complies with tree planting bylaws and fire smart guidelines as well. Uh, Mr. Stoby, your, your three minutes has elapsed. If you could draw to a close and then we'll get to the staff presentation. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I'm just going to skip to this. Uh, this is the uh, stormwater management plan. The blue is highlighting the actual stormwater requirements, the rain gardens, and as proposed new retaining water will be all compliant with additional North Van bylaws. Over the past five years, we've worked hard with various consultants and municipal departments. I want to thank the various people involved with the planning and in the engineering levels. It's a great project and we have support with, uh, from the local neighbourhoods. At this point in time, I respectfully request support in the zoning application and if you've got any questions, 
I'd be more than happy to help uh, and answer those questions and concerns. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, and now I'm going to go over to Mr. Hartford. Uh, your Worship and members of Council, Mr. Stoby has gone into quite a lot of detail on the proposal, but I'll, I'll provide some uh, introductory comments. Um, Synthesis Design has applied on behalf of the owner to rezone this property to accommodate subdivision into two single family lots. The site is 1,448 square meters or just over 15,500 square feet in area. It's located on the east side of Prospect Road in the upper Delbrook neighborhood. The lot is occupied as was shown by a single older house and is currently zoned single family residential one acre zone or RS1. The surrounding properties are a mix of RS1, RS2 and RS3. By law 8524 proposes to amend the site zoning from the RS1 zone to the RS2 zone and to add the property to the table of special minimum lot sizes in section 310 of the zoning bylaw to reflect the width of the proposed lots. The rezoning is being proposed in accordance with the North Lonsdale Delbrook plan, which designates the site as low density residential and serves as a reference policy document for this area. The North Lonsdale Delbrook plan includes provisions for this site and other large lots in the 4200 and 4300 blocks of Prospect Road to be rezoned to either RS2 or RS3 to allow subdivision. The proposal is generally consistent with the plan provisions because it rezones the property to RS3 and the newly created lots would meet the minimum lot area requirement of the RS3 zone. As the proposed lots would have a width of just under 52 feet, they would not meet the minimum width requirement in the RS3 zone of 59 feet. Accordingly, bylaw 8524 proposes to include special minimum lot width requirements in the zoning bylaw for these two lots. Access to the lots, as was shown, is via a single shared driveway from Prospect Avenue and a minimum of three off-street parking spaces would be required for each lot. The proposal was circulated to nearby residents and to the Delbrook Community Association. Comments received from neighbors included some concerns with increased density, impacts to privacy, a desire to see existing trees and shrubs retained, and the potential for impacts to views. There were no comments from the community association specific to the project. In response to the neighbor comments, the applicant notes that the site design avoids impacts on neighbors trees and hedges. 18 replacement trees will be provided to enhance privacy and the proposed shared driveway as was shown will allow the future houses to sit closer to the front lot line, which should help to lessen impacts on views. The rezoning bylaw is recommended for first reading this evening and for referral to the required public hearing. And uh, if there are any detailed questions, uh, Mr. Stoby of Synthesis Designs is available as am I. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hartford. I see Councillors Bond and Kern. Councillor Bond, do you have a motion? I'll move the staff recommendation. Staff recommendation has been moved. Councillor Kern, are you seconding? Thank you. Councillor Bond, your comments. Uh, not many comments here. To, we have a detail, detailed presentation from the applicant. Uh, I think this is uh, five years in process so far to uh, build two homes where one home currently sits. So uh, I think it should go to public hearing. Thank you. Councillor Curran. Um, well, that was quite a, quite a summation. Um, I, I think that uh, one thing I've learned in this job is that it's not just about what you do, it's what, what could happen without doing anything. And so I think that um, this could be, the trees could all be removed, a large house could be built um, as is. And I think that um, two smaller homes um, are, is, is a better option um, for this area. So I also, um, yeah, would would support it going to public hearing. We didn't get to to see everything that the applicant um, had, but I think um, planting the right types of trees for um, our environment and um, looking at stormwater management, um, biodiversity strategy that we're working on. There's lots of ways that I think we um, have to move forward looking at at that differently because the neighborhoods are over time going to change. So um, I I think um, it sounds like this has been in the works for a long time. So. I'll support it. Thank you, Councillor Curran. Uh, 
Yes, so, uh, uh, and the applicant did not get to make their full presentation, but if the matter goes to public hearing, they'll have 15 minutes to make a presentation at that time, as well as additional time for, for staff. Uh, my own comments on the matter, um, I used to live about a block away from this place, so I know the neighborhood very well. Um, I, I wouldn't say that small lots is characteristic uh, of the neighborhood, even though despite that, the, the lot immediately south has a similar configuration. Uh, what I'm gonna be looking for in the public hearing is um, uh, you know, what kind of impacts this is going to have on access, egress and flow in that area. Um, uh, but I, I suspect most of the houses, because of the steep nature of the surrounding area, view impacts are gonna be pretty negligible um, on it. Um, just it's on the upper side of the hill. It's, uh, it's not in the general direction that, that is the most desire line. Everybody's trying to look downtown from there, which is generally to the south and west from this, this spot. Um, and so I, I don't see this as impacting many properties around it. Uh, but I am looking forward to seeing what the neighbors have to say about uh, the potential impact. So um, I'll be supportive of this going to public hearing, but uh, uh, I'm eagerly looking forward to see what the neighbors have to say. Is there another, any other speakers on the matter? Oh, sorry, my screen turned off. Councillor Hanson. Yeah, thank you very much. I agree with everything uh, that's been said uh, to this point. Uh, the only point uh, I would highlight is that uh, what's being proposed is a substantially identical uh, to what was done immediately to the south at 4260 and 4250. So um, on an equity basis, uh, I think we have some reason to um, um, uh, look on this with uh, favor, at least for the time being. And also uh, uh, to the extent that there is going to be uh, public input uh, over and above what we've already received in the report, that will obviously be supplied to the public hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hanson. I see no further speakers on the matter at this time, so I'm going to call the motion, call the question on the motion. All those in favor? Contrary minded? Motion carries. Okay. Thank you, Council. Moving on to item 8.8. .8. This is another one that we have a speaker for this evening. The speaker that we have is Vicki Chu from Fairborn. Vicki Chu, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Can you hear me, uh, Your Worship? Yes, I can. Welcome. You have three minutes to address the Council. Okay. Good evening, Your Worship and members of Council. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, my name is Vicki Chu, and I'm the Vice President of Fairborn Homes. Since receiving Council's input last November, our team has been working to further improve the proposal together with staff, Council, and the community. The proposal supports important Council priorities and delivers on key objectives of the OCP. We're proud to be presenting the proposal to you this evening. We have reduced the height of the tower by five stories, added more rental homes, provided further roadway improvements, and increased sustainability measures to reduce the overall carbon footprint of the project. This proposal will create 420 new homes. Over 50% of these homes will be below market and market rental. The 215 rental homes proposed will expand the supply of new rental and affordable housing in the district, including 45 below market rental homes to support low to moderate income families. I'm also pleased to share we will implement a locals first policy that will give district residents the first opportunity to make Lynn Creek Town Center their home. The project will also contribute two and a half million dollars to help fund the district's affordable and special needs housing, infrastructure improvements, and public facility enhancements. Approximately 16,000 square feet of land dedications are also being contributed to create a new roadway for better traffic circulation and new pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure for safe walking and cycling in the town center. New bus infrastructure on Mountain Highway will also maximize neighborhood access to TransLink's frequent transit network. Two bicycle spaces for every home, electric charging infrastructure, and car share program will further support alternative transportation options to reduce private vehicle reliance for future residents. The proposed daycare will create spaces for approximately 80 to 100 children and will advance Council's child care action plan for the Lower Lynn area. We believe the proposal before you this evening represents a thoughtful and comprehensive plan that will contribute to the betterment of the neighborhood and help create a town center that will benefit all district residents. Thank you again for your time this evening, and we look forward to your comments and feedback. Our architect and I, and my colleague who is attending the meeting in person before you tonight, 
are available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Councillor Bond, I'm going to need to take a very brief bio break. Are you able to take over the meeting for, for a few minutes? And then uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to go over to uh, Darren Varies for his uh, comments and presentation. Thank you, Your Worship and members of Council. I'll just share my screen here. All right, thank you. Um, sorry, give me one moment here. Your Worship, members of council, my name is Darren Beers and I'm a senior development planner with the District of North Vancouver. This presentation will provide a brief overview of the proposal at 1510 Crown Street. IBI Architects has applied to rezone the subject property to permit the construction of a mixed use development which includes 205 strata units, 170 market rental units, and 45 non-market rental units for a total of 420 residential units. The proposal also includes ground floor commercial space and a child care facility. Implementation of the project requires council consideration of rezoning bylaw 8505, housing agreement bylaws 8506 and 8507, and development cost charge waiver bylaw 8508. Next, I'll provide a brief overview of the project's evolution and Council's review to date. On November 2nd, 2020, Council reviewed the project at an early input meeting. Council provided input and referred the project back to staff for discussion with the applicant. The applicant revised a number of elements of the project based on Council comments. On March 29th, 2021, Council reviewed the revised proposal once again, and at that meeting directed staff to prepare the necessary bylaws for consideration of the project. The applicant has submitted a revised proposal, which is now ready for council's consideration this evening. In terms of site details, the property is located on the north side of Crown Street and the east side of Mountain Highway. The site is approximately 2.4 acres in size and comprises the Dykoff Nursery commercial site shown in blue and five single family lots shown in yellow. As noted in the early input report, the site includes a 1,664 square foot area of the existing fire hall number two site shown in green and an abutting 6,077 square foot road allowance shown in purple proposed to be purchased from the district of North Vancouver. The related land dedication bylaw uh, 1107 amendment bylaw 8509 is subject of item 8.9 on tonight's agenda. The proposed sale of these lands is subject to council's approval of rezoning bylaw 8505. The OCP designates the site as Commercial residential mixed use level three, which envisions high density uses with a mix of commercial and residential development at a density of approximately 3.5 FSR. Zoning for the site is currently a mix of single family RS4 and RS5 and commercial C7 zoning. The site is proposed to be changed to a new comprehensive development zone CD136, tailored specifically to the project and the proposed density of 3.5 FSR. The site is also located in development permit areas for forming character of multifamily development, energy and water conservation and greenhouse gas emission reduction and protection from natural hazards, Creek hazard. The Lynn Creek implementation plan shows the general concept for this block with the subject site outlined in orange. The plan envisions a new north south lane at the east side of the site shown in blue which would connect Crown and Hunter Streets. The town center plaza shown in purple and a connection from the plaza to Marie Place Park to the east shown in green. The site plan shows the general layout of the project. And please note on this image, north is to the left of the image with Mountain Highway on the bottom of the screen. The project includes ground level commercial space outlined in blue, which fronts Mountain Highway. Atop the podium are two mid-rise buildings, a seven-story market rental building outlined in purple, and an eight-story mixed market and non-market rental building outlined in dark green. The seven-story building consists of 143 market rental units, while the eight-story building consists of 27 market rental units and 45 non-market rental units. At the south end of the site, outlined in yellow, is a 24-story strata residential building, 
extending along Crown Street. This building contains 201 apartment units and four ground-oriented units facing Crown Street. Above the, roof, above the commercial podium, outlined in orange, is a rooftop amenity area, outdoor amenity area for residents of the two rental buildings. At the rear of the property is a new lane to connect Crown at the south and Hunter at the north. Access from the lane is a surface parking area outlined in green. Um, and entrances to two underground parking areas indicated at the arrows in blue here and here. A new pedestrian connection has also been added to the site plan between the commercial podium and the base of the 24 story building to connect the parking, parking courtyard at the rear of Mountain Highway, or sorry, at the rear of the project with Mountain Highway. The town center plaza is at the north end of the, of the property and a smaller plaza facing Mountain Highway is located further to the south. Residential lobby entrances are shown in green for the market rental building, non-market rental and strata homes. Turning to commercial space, the layout of the ground floor includes a mix of spaces, including a 23,000 square foot space designed to accommodate a local grocery store, a 10,000 square foot space uh, for a childcare provider shown in green, and a range of smaller commercial spaces that could be considered for independent retailers. An amenity space for residents of the rental buildings is located in the Northeast portion of the site to take advantage of the future pedestrian connection to the east. The applicant has adjusted the housing pro proposal since March 2021 council update. An additional eight market rental units and eight strata units have been added to the proposal for a total of 170 market rental units and 205 strata units. The proposed number of non-market rental units remains unchanged at 45 and the proposed rents for the non-market rental units are generally affordable to low to moderate income households in the district. A total of 215 rental units in the market and non-market rents uh, are, are now proposed in the project. Showing this information on a table for comparison and for the current total of 420 units, we can see that the increase in market rental units to 170 and the previously proposed non-market units at 45, the total of 215 rent rental units in the project constitutes just over 51% of the total housing units with strata homes comprising the remainder. The applicant has considered the project phasing to assist in early delivery of project elements with the greatest public benefit. Phase one in the red outline includes the commercial space with childcare, market rental housing and non-market rental housing, underground parking garage and the new laneway. Phase two in the orange outline includes the strata condominium building. Construction of both phases could occur at the same time, but occupation of phase one would occur first. The applicant has also reviewed options to improve the energy performance of the project and to reduce environmental impacts. The proposal would meet step three of the BC Energy Code step code and include a low carbon energy system for all residential components of the project. The applicant is proposing a fossil fuel free mechanical design for these components. The commercial component, the, sorry, the commercial component of the project would comply with step three of the BC building, the BC step code in accordance with the district's recent updates to the construction bylaw. To assist in the current and future needs of electric vehicle charging, the revised proposal includes provision of energy outlets for level two charging in all residential parking spaces. To assist in addressing, to addressing concerns with the use of concrete as a construction material, the applicant has committed to using fly ash concrete in the project, which avoids the use of some of the more carbon intensive components of a typical concrete mix. The applicant has also committed to the use of green roofs for the two mid-rise buildings. The applicant has revised their parking proposal to include 396 parking stalls for residential purposes and an additional 29 stalls for visitors and 39 stalls for commercial purposes. Bicycle parking proposed includes a total of 805 spaces for a ratio of 1.9 bicycle parking spaces per residential unit with an additional 56 spaces for the use of commercial employees, patrons, and visitors. The four bylaws are recommended for introduction and the rezoning bylaws recommended for referral to, to the public hearing. That concludes my presentation on the updates 
to this detailed application. And as mentioned, Christopher Phillips and Vicky Chu of Fairborn Homes and Martin Bruckner of IBI Architects are available this evening to answer specific questions uh, that council may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Varys. Uh, members of council looking for your direction on this uh, as a member of council willing to move a motion. Councillor Back indicated. Councillor Back, do you have a, a motion? I'll move the recommendation, Your Worship. Moving the staff recommendation. Is there a seconder on the matter? I see Councillor Bond's hand. Okay, Councillor Back, your comments. Thank you, Your Worship, uh, and thank you for the presentation. Um, as was highlighted, we've uh, had the opportunity to watch this project evolve uh, with a couple of uh, early input opportunities uh, to, uh, to see this project. Um, I, I really think this project represents uh, an exciting part of the Lynn Creek Town Centre, uh, very much the, the hub in, in terms of its location, uh, right across from the, the park, uh, our new rec centre. Um, it, it is really going to be that gathering point uh, for those residents who live in the area. Um, I think there's a lot of highlights of this project uh, that I, I think are worthy of, of hearing from the public on by it, advancing this to public hearing. Um, an awful lot of rental homes, over 50% of the project, including um, all of the below market units that are included. One of the aspects I'm uh, most uh, excited about is the childcare spaces, 80 to 100, which is a significant amount in this area. Um, and according to our childcare uh, strategy, we know that we're, we're gonna need um, more than that, but that certainly um, will fulfill a lot of the need uh, for childcare in that part of the district. Um, and then the long-awaited grocery store that I'm speaking with a number of the residents who are in that uh, neighborhood now have, have really looked forward to for a long time and having a, a grocery store that they can that they can walk to. Um, so I think as we, you know, look to the future of Lynn Creek, this this is really going to be the um, like I say the, the center of it and what kind of defines uh, that area. It really makes it people friendly with the plazas, and I, I love the idea of the the big plaza and the, the smaller one on the other uh, end of the project. Um, and uh, I know there's lots of great environmental aspects to this project as well, and I'm sure uh, Councillor Curran and others will speak to, but I think overall it, it is worthy to um, hear from the public. At this point, the applicant has put in uh, a lot of effort to, to listen to Council, and I appreciate the re revisions that they've made uh, to get us to this point. Thank you, Councillor Back. Uh, I believe seconder was Councillor Bond, followed by Councillor Hansen. Councillor Bond. Uh, thanks, Mayor Little. Council back did a very good summary. This project has been in process for a long time. Council's had two kicks of the can at it already, and the applicant has gone back and made changes uh, that uh, that were suggested by council. Uh, there is a lot of uh, a lot of pros, I think, here in this application. Councilor back mentioned about half of the homes here are rental homes. There's a good mix of uh, smaller homes for singles and couples in a in a town center. Uh, as well as some larger homes uh, for uh, for people starting families, uh, there's a relatively low parking ratio, I think, on this pro on this project. And uh, you know, I spend I spend a lot of time in this neighborhood. It's uh, about a three minute bike ride from from my home. And uh, as Councillor Back said, uh, a lot of people here are, are kind of waiting and hoping that more uh, more is going to happen in the neighborhood. Uh, I know I talk to uh, residents that live in the Sealand building uh, frequently and they're, they're like, uh, it's nice to go to the Bridge Brewery, but we need some more stores. We need, we need a grocery store. Uh, and they're excited at the, at the prospect, at least the ones that I talk to, but uh, we'll hear more at the public hearing, obviously. But they're excited at the prospect of having uh, more amenities in the neighborhood. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why a lot of people moved there in the first place. So um, I had a small question, uh, the applicant may or may not address this at the public hearing, but I'd, I'd be interested to know uh, in the environmental and the sustainability uh, mechanical systems, whether there's uh, opportunities for um, heat exchange between the commercial units, specifically the grocery store and, and the rest of the building. Um, but I do definitely think this is uh, worthy of a full presentation at a public hearing. And so I'll be voting in favor here at first reading. Thank you, Councillor Bond. Councillor Hansen. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I will not uh, be su supporting it uh, uh, going to first reading. Um, uh, no surprise in that, in that uh, I'm maintaining a consistent uh, position towards these types of developments. I certainly respect uh, the amount of rental, 51%. We're, we're seeing that number uh, rise uh, relative to uh, many of the 
pro proposals we looked at in the past. I respect the fact that there are 45 affordable units put forward, the child care plan, and many other aspects of the plan that have been uh, highlighted as desirable. And I accept those aspects of the plan are desirable. Uh, the proposal, however, sits within a, a broader com community, a set of community concerns. And uh, as I cast my vote with respect to whether this should go to a public hearing, I'm seeking to reflect what I understand to be a public sentiment uh, expressed to me, but also expressed, I believe, in, in the last election about the order and priority of our actions. And first of all, we're talking about adding a lot of cars, a lot of units uh, in a location uh, that is, is obviously going to contribute to um, uh, traffic, challenges. We still haven't addressed uh, those most significant challenges. Uh, our traffic in infrastructure remains limited and yet uh, we just continue to add and add and add and we don't seem to have a plan and uh, we await that plan. So that's one aspect of it. As well, uh, we've got this imbalance of housing types. We've got too much market ownership, too much expensive housing, expensive condos, not enough rental and not enough affordable. And although uh, this is a step in the right direction, it still isn't a balancing of those uh, housing categories. We heard uh, the presentation last week from the uh, uh, Affordable Housing uh, Committee and they warned us not to just lapse into uh, the old ways of thinking and doing the old things. And from my point of view, approving another 205 market ownership units in a 24 story building in this location with 464 uh, parking spaces. It's it, sub, substantially just the same old, same old. It isn't uh, making the kind of change that we need to make in terms of our uh, community planning. Um, what we need to do, and uh, it, from my point of view, there's widespread community support uh, for what I'm about to say, we need to address transportation uh, so that people can get around and so cars are not just sitting stationary. I don't know how many of you saw the long line today, but just sitting there, uh, it's a great waste of resources. And we need to rebalance our housing options so that there's more rental, more affordable, uh, so that we have a greater balance of, of opportunities uh, more co-ops, uh, more supportive housing, uh, a, a balance of opportunities for people in our community uh, so that we can have a, a balanced community and not just uh, a community of people living in expensive condos. So um, no surprise in my comments. Uh, I will remain true to this position, uh, at least until the, the public uh, indicate to me, perhaps in the next election, that they have a different sentiment. And um, I, I very much look forward to uh, approving housing that's aimed at uh, the, the, the parts of our community that haven't been addressed uh, with the housing that's been approved today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Hanson. Councillor Kern. Uh, thank you. I. This is our third time um, with this project before us. So, um, and I think uh, some colleagues have, have um, captured a lot of the sentiments that were um, brought up previously. So I will try not to repeat those. Uh, I did want to comment on um, the staff report. I really appreciated staff aligning um, the report with a lot of the goals that had come out of our um, recent OCP review. And um, the number one priority action, I, although I don't think these are necessarily, I don't want to mischaracterize that they're prioritized in terms of, of number, but um, if you look at the, the graph, the one that was the most effective at achieving um, the targets was to achieve town and village centers that deliver low carbon, compact and diverse housing, um, transportation choices and supportive public amenities and employment space. Um, so I thought um, staff did a great job of lining them up to specific goals that were set forth in that plan, as well as um, aligning with the child care plan social equity lens, some of the new work that we've done. So I just wanted to compliment staff on that. I think it really helped because I was going to go through and do that. And I was like, staff did it. Yay. So thank you for that. Um, 
a lot of the the same. I think this project has um, improved. I don't think it's the same as, as what we saw. Um, I think that uh, some of the things that I'll be interested in um, hearing from the community, and I also just want to say, like, I have heard a lot of folks in the community um, uh, out and about saying that they are excited about seeing this town center, especially um, people who live there. Um, some of the concerns that I have with um, towers that I've commented on before are social isolation. Um, and so I appreciate that there are both outdoor spaces now, I think with green roofs, more opportunities to um, for folks to connect as well as two large um, amenity spaces in the buildings. I think that's important. Um, I am curious about how the potential $10 a day childcare would um, connect with this particular childcare, um, if that's only for not-for-profits. So I think just a little more clarity around that, because I, I think it's it there's so many issues around childcare. It's it's staff being paid properly, it's staff being able to live here, um, but it's also people being able to afford um, childcare. So just a little bit more information around that. Um, uh, Councilor Brown brought up um, heat exchange, also interested in like heat recovery um, systems. Uh, as I asked some of my expert building friends about concrete, what are other ways they <clears throat> talked about um, asking the applicant what the plan is to prevent thermal bridging, um, basically to make the most effective building because when you have decks, um, it can actually be inefficient. So I'm just, uh, I think patios are great, but just wondering if, if they've considered that. Um, and I, this, the the uh, 2017 trip diary from Metro Vancouver um, or TransLink, which is the most current, um, says that out of every uh, municipality in the region, we have the highest per capita, um, or sorry, highest daily trip average. Like we take the most trips per car of any municipality in the entire region. And I think that um, that's why the um, close uh, achieving these town and village centers is uh, is going to minimize um, those trips. I, of course, want no parking anywhere, but that includes everywhere throughout <laughs> the district because I think there should be um, affordable, sustainable, um, convenient options to move that don't involve cars. But we're not there yet. So um, based on that, we'll do something great in, in those parking spaces um, as soon as we can um, come up with some new solutions, which I do think exist. Um, and I think this actually puts us closer to sustainable transit options then um, further, even though that seems counterintuitive, um, that's been a learning on my end. So I look forward to, to hearing more from the public. Thank you, Councillor Curran. Um, my own comments on the matter, uh, you know, I think that the, uh, uh, I, I, when we came back from the early input opportunity, I made a lot of the similar comments that I thought that there was evidence that the developer had listened to the community. I, I did note that uh, uh, their solution to every problem was to add more units, add more units, add more units. And, and uh, I, I don't know that I always agree with that, uh, but in this area, uh, from the very beginning of our Lowerland Town Center charrette process that we went through, and now we're talking over 10 years, probably almost 15 years ago when we did those planning sessions, uh, the, the, um, the focus was the crown and mountain intersection, that this was going to be the heart of the Lowerland Town Center as far as services were concerned. Now, in the early stages, the only assemblies that were taking place were actually away from this, this central core area, but that was the goal, was that that uh, Crown and Mountain was gonna be the heart of, of this area. Uh, and I supported it then and I support it now. Um, my, uh, you know, I, I do have some concerns. I, I come at the parking angle from, from a different approach from other councillors. I think that uh, parking is uh, both, uh, maybe a space for a car today, but it's a space for dirty, flexible space into the future uh, that's going to allow that building when it reaches its uh, need to do a major renovation or refurbishment. Hopefully there won't be as much need for cars in that space, but there certainly will be needs for places to be able to to uh, maintain the building and uh, maybe offer more uh, storage opportunities or flexibility or maybe uh, the e-mobility services of the future will require more than a common lockup, but maybe individual people will be able to convert their parking spaces over to lockups for their for e-devices. I don't know what the future will hold, but if you don't build some flexibility into the space, you, you won't have it, uh, that opportunity in the, in the future. 
Um, so I'm a little concerned that the parking uh, component is a little bit low with that in mind. Um, now, as far as alternatives to driving cars, this is probably the second highest served area in the district of North Vancouver. There's five buses that stop outside this address. Um, uh, and that's just in one direction. There's a, obviously they return through that space as well. So, you know, it, it's hard to say that, you know, if, if there was a community in the district of North Vancouver where you could uh, go down to one car, go down to no cars, where you could, you could in, entirely rely on alternative transportation spaces, it's here or within a couple of blocks of here. Uh, so I, I do think that the parking component is reasonable when you consider that. Uh, but I, I wouldn't want to see any reductions because I think you have to have that flexible space for, for the health of the building going forward. Um, and so I, I don't want to see any further reductions. But uh, I think the, uh, uh, the, the applicant certainly responded to council when we had our early input opportunity. I look forward to seeing how they respond to the public following the public hearing. Uh, and uh, I, I, But I do think that we're close to a viable project on this space and it certainly warrants uh, going to the community and asking for their advice on the matter. So I'll be supportive of issuing first reading tonight and going to a public hearing. I don't see any other hands from council at this time. Councillor Kerr, a second time. Um, just a couple other comments. Um, I um, wanted to know, and, and this can be answered in that process because it looks like it's moving forward. Um, if we've um, been able to work with Squamish Nation at all, it looks like they're going to be able to um, build some housing nearby. So maybe there's some synergies that could could happen by doing something together. I don't know. Um, just wanted to, to make a comment on that. Um, and then in in our um, OCP action, um, priority action, one of the, the uh, items was to secure spaces for nonprofit community and social service providers. And um, I'm really interested in, um, I'm on the library board. There's some really innovative stuff happening there. I know that we have our, um, uh, recreation center um, and uh, what's it called? Lynn, sorry, Lynn Creek something. What's what's our new Lynn Creek center? I, I don't think we've officially unveiled the name on the facility. Let's but. decide tonight. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, there's, there is a component um, in there, but I, I just think uh, I, I, in that um, area, I would be interested in what other, um, because it looks like there's some smaller units um, that could be really innovative. So um, I just wanted to bring that up. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor. Okay, so I'm going to uh, call the question on the vote. Just checking in with the clerks on this. 8.9 is directly related to this. You want to handle that as a separate subsequent motion or tie it all together? Okay. They will deal with this first and then we'll move on to 8.9, which is obviously inextricably linked to this, but uh, yes. Okay, so on this matter, I'm going to uh, call the question on the motion. I do note that Councillor Forbes, your camera is off. So if you could record your vote by voice with your microphone uh, clear, just so we can get a record of that, that'd be appreciated. But I'll call the question on the matter. All those in favor, contrary-minded. Councillor Forbes, can you hear me? I just need to clarify your vote. You're, you're muted. I'm afraid I'm going to have to assume that Councillor Forbes is, is absent for the vote. And so at this point, I'm going to say that uh, opposed is, is uh, Councillor Hansen. Uh, Mr. Clerk, can I just clarify with you? Uh, yeah, Your Worship, sorry about that. Just trying to get your attention. Um, Councillor Forbes is showing uh, in the meeting. She hasn't checked out. And in accordance with the community charter, any uh, you have to actively vote in opposition. So by default, her position that, would be in support. And I believe you're going down the road of Councillor Hansen being the only one in opposition, which would be correct. I don't think it changes materially the the, the vote. But uh, is there an opportunity in this in this situation, just more broadly, uh, is there an opportunity for a councillor who is disconnected inadvertently or unavailable? Are they able to record their vote? in advance of the meeting minutes being produced? Well, no, we, we need it recorded in real time uh, now for history. Okay. Limitations of, of where we're at. So what the ruling from uh, the clerk was, was that uh, uh, our current policy is if you are recorded as in attendance of the meeting, 
uh, that you cannot abstain from a vote. You either have to vote against it or you're considered to vote in favor of it. So at this point, the record will reflect that Councillor Forbes has voted in favor of the matter and Councillor Hansen is opposed. Okay, thank you very much. Moving on to item 8.9, which is connected to this. Uh, this is again uh, a land dedication that would have to take place in order for the, uh, the 8.8 .8 to proceed. And so uh, I see Mr. Milburn, you've activated your camera. Did you have comments on the matter? Uh, just to note, Your Worship, um, as you've already stated, these are, these are connected and, and that this um, uh, proposed change uh, would not occur if council does not approve the related zoning bylaw. So they are specifically linked and happy to answer any questions about that. Thank you very much. Okay, I have uh, Councillor Bond wishing to speak first. You have a motion, sir? I'll move the staff recommendation. Thank you. Is there a seconder on the matter? Seconded by Councillor Back. Councillor, any further comments? Uh, nothing further. It's just uh, related to the land uh, uh, dedication as mentioned by staff in the report. Thank you very much. Councillor Bond, any further comments? Ken? Okay, I'm um, back. Yeah. Uh, no. And uh, so I will uh, call the question on the matter. This is 8.9. Uh, this is uh, all right. So I will I'll call the question on the matter. Oh, sorry. If I sorry. could just uh, clarify your wish that uh, I don't want, wish my support for this motion uh, to be taken as a support for the underlying rezoning. I'm uh, voting in favor simply because of the procedural uh, element of this uh, 8.9. Thank you for the clarification, Councillor Hanson. So Councillor Hanson is supporting this, but is not in favor of the overall issue uh, that we discussed under 8.8. .8. Okay, uh, so I will call the question on 8.9. All those in favor? Contrary minded? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, and uh, thank you very much, Council, for that uh, response. Now we're going to move on to reports from Council or staff. Uh, checking in with uh, uh, the CAO in just a moment. Uh, I guess, uh, sorry, I'll just make my own report first. Uh, there's been a lot that's happened this week, and I did want to mention a couple of events on the weekend. Uh, it was at the uh, 50th anniversary for the uh, Ecology Center, where we recognize that that facility has been operating and serving our community and teaching about the importance of uh, ecological awareness in our community uh, for 50 years. It's an incredible milestone, and so I was able to be there on Saturday with them. Uh, also, at the same time, we recognized 50 years of the completion of the Baden-Powell Trail and the dedication of the trail. Uh, and so we were there gathered with a bunch of representatives of Scouts Canada uh, to be able to recognize that. And, and what you just have to be aware of is that, you know, at those early stages 50 years ago, uh, the district had very few parks and very few reserved set up spaces. And since that time, uh, that, that close access, access to wilderness, close access to park has really become one of the defining characteristics of our community. And it was great to have uh, the family of our former parks manager, Dirk Ustindi, there present, uh, and uh, he was such a, a, an important part of creating that identity for our community, and so to have his family present for that event uh, after he was there when they originally commissioned the Baden-Powell Trail in partnership with Scouts Canada. It was uh, very moving. Um, we also had another very important event that I, I think a number of members of council are probably going to comment on today, but I'll just start with some basics. Uh, we had the first Truth and Reconciliation uh, Day uh, observed across Canada last Thursday. And uh, I know that uh, a lot of people in our community uh, observed the day in, in their own ways, but uh, uh, myself, a number of members of councils, uh, our MLAs, MPs, and a bunch of representatives from our school boards decided to join uh, the Tsleil-Waututh Nation and the Squamish, Squamish Nation, uh, both in a walk from the administration building at Tsleil-Waututh to about eight kilometers away at the uh, former site of the St. Paul's Residential School, where we met up with representatives from the Squamish community and other people uh, from, from the community to hear stories from elders who, who lived through uh, the residential school system. It was a very moving event. What I was uh, really touched by uh, as we went through was uh, the numbers of people from our community that came out to roadside on a rainy day to express their support and show that their emotional connection to what was going on and their understanding of what was what was going on. It was a very touching uh, uh, tribute 
Uh, and, and I know that we have a long way to go in terms of uh, reconciliation in our community, but I think there is a lot of understanding built through that process. And uh, so I look forward to uh, working with our uh, with the uh, First Nations communities in our in our area uh, uh, for to better understand our role in reconciliation. And uh, I'm glad that we could be there to be a support uh, last Thursday. Uh, that's my report. Uh, Mr. Stewart, do you have any comments to add? Uh, Your Worship, just uh, two things. Um, one is that uh, many residents may have read in the, uh, the press that there is another dispute between Axiona and Metro with respect to the, uh, the waste treatment plant. Uh, I can't add more to it other than we will continue to monitor that and work with uh, Metro Vancouver to try to resolve this and, and, and get that project uh, back on track. But um, as I find out more, I'll, I'll surely let council and, and, and the community know. Uh, the other thing is uh, tomorrow, I believe, or maybe it's tomorrow or Wednesday, uh, we're going to have a, a kind of a ribbon cutting at the Maplewood Fire Services Center. And uh, that's been, a, a, again, another project that's been in the, in the works for at least five years. Uh, we've done considerable work uh, trying to remediate the land. And uh, so I think this is a real success story, and I think it'll be a, a story that will have uh, repercussions in terms of the services that are provided to Seymour. And so we're really looking forward to this project moving forward. Uh, that's all I have at this point, Your Worship. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, yes, it is planned for tomorrow at this point. You have the, the uh, Maplewood Fire Center groundbreaking, although uh, it's right about when it's supposed to be at its rainiest tomorrow. Okay, uh, thank you. I don't see any other hands. Any other members of council wishing to make a report at this time? Oops. I have Councillor Curran. Uh, thanks, Mayor Little. Um, just wanted to um, add that today is National Day of Action for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, Girls, and Two Spirit. And um, there's 231 calls for justice. Some of them apply to local government. Um, and I think that's a, a big part of, of the the overall process moving forward um, in terms of um, truth and, um, and justice. So I just wanted to uh, recognize that. And I had mentioned that I attended um, a disability justice workshop on Sunday, um, which I'll definitely be talking to some staff about. There were lots of, um, uh, my understanding expanded in a, in a lot of ways. It was really um, important. And, um, and then the, the walk, um, you know, the district is, um, has, committed to implementing the um, municipal specific calls to action. Um, and it was a real honor to to walk um, that walk. And like you said, to see the community coming out. And I think, um, you know, the 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 challenge now um, with everything is to move from the performative to the substantive and like really like changing um, our understanding. And I, I feel like there's a lot of willingness to do that. I um, was with um, Dennis Thomas, who's an elected counselor. Um, we spoke with Seacove, some Seacove students today about environmental justice and just all the connections and the, their questions were so incredible. And I said, I never would have been asking those questions um, at your age. So I think it's um, in, in important and uh, something to, to build on. So that's it. Counselor, any other hands at this point? We mentioned, I, I think there was also a uh, I did go to the RCMP detachment where there was another um, event on Truth and Reconciliation Day. And at that event, there were more school board trustees and other representatives from the community. Uh, and uh, that one uh, featured a lot of music and dance from Squamish Nation elders and, uh, uh, and uh, also particularly uh, the stories of two residential school survivors as well at uh, that one. So uh, again, uh, uh, a great way to observe it and reflect on on what has happened in our community. Councillor Forbes. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm getting some text messages. Uh, apparently I was missed in the meeting, um, but I notified, uh, I notified the confidential clerk that um, I was on a bathroom break like you were earlier. Okay. Yeah, and uh, uh, that's that's fine. And 
I think uh, you know what we had said a while ago, although we, we just haven't had that many of these hybrid meetings yet, was that if you want to indicate that you're stepping away, that you are withdrawing from the meeting, you can just leave the meeting. And then uh, when you come back, reignite the, the link. And that helps the clerk manage that issue of whether somebody is a part of the meeting. And so um, uh, it's a little harder to do from my seat because I'm the co-host for the meeting. Uh, but that's one way to, if you, if you don't want to be marked as in favor on a vote uh, that you're not present for, you do need to leave the meeting, but uh, uh, that's fine. I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Uh, we were able to record your vote on 8.9. I hope that reflects your views on 8.8, .8, but okay. Thank you very much, Council. I see no further speakers at this time. So uh, once again, thank you all for participating. We appreciate the members of the public who came out and attended and the people who participated virtually. We still have six attendees virtually hanging on to the meeting, but we had really great attendance throughout the course of the evening. We do appreciate it. Hope you feel welcome. And uh, I hope everybody has a fantastic week. Thank you for participating. Someone move adjournment.